from St. Lucie County Stadium in Port St. Lucie, Florida. Today, the Mets meet the Atlanta Braves. Mets Baseball 94 is brought to you by Bud Light. If you want great taste that won't fill you up and never lets you down, make it a Bud Light. By your Tri-State Toyota dealer. I love what you do for me, Toyota. By Macy's, we're part of your life. And by Coca-Cola, always plain, always Coca-Cola. Pitching for the Braves today, Kent Merker with a record of 3-1 and an earned run average of 2.86 in 1993. And on the mound for the Mets, Doc Gooden. Last year, 12-15 and 15 for the year with a 3.45 earned run average. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another glorious afternoon here in Florida, Mets baseball on WWOR. I'm Tim McCarver, along with Ralph Kiner, Gary Thorne also with us this afternoon, and it's not that far away, opening day in Chicago at Wrigley Field on April the 4th, and in all probability, Doc Gooden will be starting, and he's also starting today for the Mets against the Braves. And Doc Gooden, very good on opening days, 5-1 and one with the New York Mets. You can see the comparative records of two of the best pitchers in baseball right there, Gooden and Clemens, both with the same winning percentage. And don't forget, the Mets will open up at Chase Stadium with the Chicago Cubs, and we're looking forward to all that soon. That'll be on April the 11th, and two guys hope they're on the starting roster. Gwen Davis and Fernando Vina, they'll be starting for the Mets today. Two interesting stories in spring training. And another interesting story, Greg Olson. He'll be with Gary Thorne right after this from Snap. -up. Greg Olson as our guest. We'll be seeing him in action today. Greg, uh, not only a shot at making this team, but at this point you've got to feel pretty confident you're there. Well, you know, it's a situation where, you know, I've got to prove myself just like I did uh, when I played uh, six, six and a half years in the minor league. So I've got to come here uh, and prove that I can still play. Greg, it looks as though with the staff this season, the catcher for this team is going to be vitally important. I mean, there's some handling to be done, yes? There's no question. You have uh, two veterans in uh, Saberhagen and Gooden. Be besides that, uh, you know, Pete Smith comes over a little, uh, little bit of leadership. But after that, you got some young guys, and, and you got to be able to control those guys, make them throw strikes and stay ahead on the count, and uh, hopefully uh, I can help them do that. A little different than what you were doing when you uh, had some time with the Atlanta Braves, huh? Yeah, a little different. We had uh, quite a few uh, good pitchers over there. Uh, you know, they still got four or five real good pitchers, and, and uh, they'll be tough to beat. But, uh, you know, they developed when they were young. It's time for the Mets to develop their pitchers. Watching you at the beginning of training camp, my sense was you were trying to come in here and provide a leadership role to this team. Did you did you have that in mind when this thing all started? Well, you know, not knowing what happened last year, but hearing some of the things that happened, I think uh, they might need a guy to come in here and, you know, has fun in the clubhouse, a uh, positive person, and, and that's the kind of person I'm in. I am, and I think that's one reason Joe McElvaney brought me over here to give that positive influence in the clubhouse, and hopefully it'll influence the young guys. All right. We look forward to seeing you do that this year. Thanks for joining us. Greg Olson, who gives his son haircuts, but not himself, and that's why he looks so good and his son doesn't. We'll be back after this from Bud Light. Clouds uh, against the blue background here at Fort St. Lucie. Thomas J. White Stadium, a glorious day, and it has been a beautiful spring as the Mets will send Doc Gooden against the Atlanta Braves. That is Gooden last year in 29 starts. He has won 154 games. Only he and Tom Seaver are the two Met pitchers with 150 wins or more. So Doc on the mound. And he'll be pitching against this lineup for the Atlanta Braves. Deion Sanders will lead it off. He's in center. Jarvis Brown will play left, batting second. Batting third in right field, Tony Tarasco. Batting fourth, the first baseman, Ryan Clusco. Batting fifth, the catcher, Javier Lopez. Batting sixth, the second baseman, Mark Lemke. Batting seventh, the third baseman, Bill Pocota. Batting eighth in playing shortstop, Raphael Belliard. And the pitcher, Kent Merker, batting ninth. Deion Sanders will face Doc, who has worked five and two-thirds innings. His third start, he has walked six, and surprisingly, he has struck out no one in the first pitches upstairs. 
Sanders last year sharing duty with Otis Nixon who is now with the Boston Red Sox lifted to left field Kevin McReynolds over near the line and one away here in the first inning you saw Kevin McReynolds make that catch on the line to his left Ryan Thompson and Rick Parker Rick celebrating a birthday tomorrow Fernando Vigne at third Tim Bogart short Jeff Ken at second base Glenn Davis over at first and Greg Olson interviewed by Gary Thorne it was interesting I thought uh, in some of his comments Greg saying he really didn't uh, take it for granted that he had the club made that it's uh, almost like being in the minor league the six and a half years that he spent in the minors as the fastball is a strike to Jarvis Brown the right fielder ball one and of course he spent some of that minor league time with the New York Mets he was originally a Mets player and then went to Atlanta and worked his way onto that ball club and became the starting catcher. Good curve ball on the corner, strike two. Ball and two strikes now to Brown. Interesting how catchers are rarely referred to as players, same as pitchers. Inside corner to Brown, strike three, two out. First strikeout for Doc Gooden, and that's the first this spring. He had been wild in his previous three right starts. Here, number 26, Tony. And he Alaska. hits him with a fastball. I'd have to think the catchers are the most competitive of all the players. It's a tough position. And Tim, of course, you caught for many, many years, four decades of baseball as a catcher. Also, the uh, last guys to get themselves into shape offensively in spring training as Tony Tarasco takes the strike. I said Brown was in right. Brown is in left field, and Tarasco the right fielder this afternoon. Tony's numbers at Richmond of the International League last year. That's a weak swing right there, and good news for Gooden fans. Strike two. Tarasco, one of several outstanding prospects for the Atlanta Braves and trying to make this ball club. He's doing well this spring, hitting 333 with two home runs and 12 runs batted in. Ball and two strikes now to Tony Tarasco. And it's always tough to make a ball club when they have been champions. Braves have won the National League West three years. Line to left, McReynolds. Right there, so a strong inning for Gooden as the Braves go in order. We'll be back with the Mets after this from a Chemical. Games for Atlanta last year, some uh, key games in the latter going. The Braves winning 104, and he should be the fifth starter on that strong Braves staff this year. Kent Merker on the mound for Atlanta. And the Mets lineup will be Fernando Vina. Leading off and playing third base, batting second, the right fielder, Rick Parker. Batting third, the left fielder, Kevin McReynolds. Batting fourth at first base, Glenn Davis. Batting fifth, the second baseman, Jeff Kent. Batting sixth, the center fielder, Ryan Thompson. The seventh batter, the catcher, Greg Olson. Batting eighth, the shortstop, Tim Bogar. And Dwight Good, the pitcher, batting ninth. And the defense for the Atlanta Braves, Jarvis Brown in left, Deion Sanders in center, Tony Tarasco in right. The ex-Met and ex-Kansas City Royal, Bill Picotta at third base, Rafael Belliard at short, Mark Lemke at second, Ryan Klesko at first base, and Javi Lopez behind the plate. Fernando Vina playing at third today, Bobby Bonilla nursing some sore ribs. And he should be able to play on Monday as Vina spanks his foul on the first pitch. Nothing and one now to Fernando Vina. Hitting 270 this spring with 10 base hits, and he has the speed to be a leadoff batter. The Mets are searching for a leadoff batter. They really don't have a bona fide base stealer on the ball club. Vina has that kind of speed to steal a lot of bases. ball is low one and one to Vigna. Ralph I think and we've talked about it over the years I think too much is made about a leadoff hitter I mean the only time that a leadoff hitter is guaranteed to lead off is once however now if he plays 162 games that is 162 games that he will lead off as Vigna leads 
walked off for the first hit of the ball game and stops at first. Lavinia continues his strong spring performance. Well, when you figure the average times at the plate in the ball game is four, so right one fourth of the time you will lead off the inning, and you're hoping it off to a good start in the first inning. The team that scores the first run of the ball game usually wins. It comes out to a percentage of about 70 ball games should out of 100. So 70% of the time you can get that first run. And you played for Gene Mock. That was his whole theory of baseball was to get the first run of the ball game. That's why Gene used to bunt early in the game. Of course, uh, you can do that if you have a strong pitching staff. If you don't have that pitching staff, you need more than one run. Mm. Rick Parker trying to hook on with the Mets as a fourth or fifth outfielder. Nothing in one now to Parker. The Mets eight and six make that ten and eight on the spring while the Braves are nine and six for their spring record. One and one to Parker. Braves with nothing to prove in the spring being the National League West champions and the Certainly an outstanding ball club. The Mets have something to prove this spring, and they have played well. They have split their two games with Atlanta this spring. Outside and high, two balls and a strike. Sue Parker, you may look for the hit and run here. And if you don't, we will. <laughs> Take your choice. <laughs> this is a good spot, though. The 2 1 count, the preferred count for the hit and run play. Yeah. And the hit and run was on. And it hit the runner. Vina is going to be called out. Parker will be credited with a hit. And clearly an example, especially on the hit and run, you've got to pick up the ball. Vina failed to look, and he's the first out in the first inning. And you say, well, it would have been an out either way, but not necessarily the kind of out you want. If he had not been hit with the ball, they would have picked up the out at first, but they would have had a runner in scoring position. That's bad base running by Vina. Yep. When you are in motion on a hit and run play or even on a steal. You've got to look and see where the ball is hit. Here, Vina looks like he's looking, but now he doesn't know where the ball is and it hits him. He looked, but not long enough. Not long that enough. was strange. Yeah. I mean, he did look, but maybe what he was thinking, Ralph, is to try to beat the ball to second base as opposed to allowing the ball to go in front of him, thinking that, well, I'm a dead out if I do that, so I'll try to beat it and the ball beat him. Maybe. One strike to McReynolds. Came back. His numbers for Kansas City last year traded for Vince Coleman during the offseason. You know, Tim, that reminds me of the story you told a couple of days ago about the billboard that you saw about the psychic. Oh, yeah. And you right. had to make an appointment to see the psychic. Right. Why? Yeah, that's right. I was driving to the ballpark the other day, and it said, uh, psychic psychic consultations appointments only why I mean, why if they know if all so that good stuff. they ought to know it <laughs> they ought to know you're coming you ought to show up and say haha i knew you were coming in today line the <laughs> well three straight hits and the mets have runners at first and second and one out kind of an unusual inning so far mac reynolds batting 321 he is thinned down and, uh, Looks Land more like Taylor. the Kevin McReynolds of two or three years ago than he does the McReynolds who hit 245 for Kansas City last year. By the way, today's umpires, Joe West behind the plate, Bruce Fremming at first base, and Charlie Williams down at third, as Glenn Davis is the batter, and he is uh, quite a story, not only for the Mets, but in baseball. Met a couple of home runs two days ago against Montreal. Some great years with the Houston Astros and then traded in a blockbuster type trade. Two pitches in an outfielder for him. And then no production at all, but on the disabled list, three years with Baltimore with various injuries. Pulled rib cage, muscle, a neck problem, and also a broken jaw from a fight.
broken jaw defending Randy Reddy in uh, Bowie, Maryland, which is right in the Baltimore area. Randy Reddy ended the season, I believe, with Oakland. Uh, as a matter of fact, played in the played in the playoffs against Toronto. Or no, that was the year before. That, that was the year before. Randy Reddy ended with Oakland, but of course, Oakland was not in the playoffs in '93. Years run together. Time flies when you're having a mm -hmm. good time. Mm. <laughs> Those numbers, by the way, those that 362 average is not right. Jim Lindemann hit 362 in Tucson, not Glenn Davis. Glenn Davis, as we mentioned, uh, was with Baltimore last year, and it's one and one now to Glenn Davis. He had 177 with Baltimore last year with only one home run in 30 games. Was sent down to the minors and got into that fight in the minor league. One and one, two on, one out here in the first inning, no score. The Mets and the Braves and Merker and Lopez are having a tough time getting together, and you often see that. We mentioned breaking in into the big leagues as a catcher with an experienced staff. Sometimes that's one of the problems, and Bobby Cox certainly knows it. He's the fine Atlanta Braves manager. And this one tapped foul, a ball and two strikes. A week after the season last year, Bobby Cox had two artificial knees implanted. Spent the winter rehabilitating his legs. And all in all, says he feels fine. Got him with a good fastball. So Merker blows Davis away, two outs, and Jeff Kent coming up. Take a look at uh, Bobby Cox. Baseman, Played uh, Jeff a Kent. little with the Yankees and with the Dodgers, but his uh, managerial career has been splendid. He was also the general manager of the Atlanta Braves. 1986 to 1990. Very reserved and very smart. He looks Jeff mean Kent. there, doesn't he? He's the nicest guy uh, in the anything, world. Anything but that. <laughs> That's his game face right there. Fastball on the corner to Jeff Kent. Kind of like Hank Bauer, who always looks so tough with that crew yeah. cut. Usually the look you get out of ex-Marines, right? Mm-hmm. He was the epitome. High ball one, one and one. This has certainly been a different spring for Jeff Kent. His first start in spring training last year was on March 22nd, and the reason for that was a sore shoulder. So uh, that was part of the reason for his slow start last year. That's the splitter that's low. Two balls and a strike now to Kent. What a year he had for the Mets last year. He led all second basemen in runs batted in in the National League and tied for the most home runs by a second baseman in the National League. Side ball three, three balls and a strike now to Jeff Kent. Put him in motion here? No, not with two out. I, I don't think three and one's a running count anyway. Two and oh, three one are hitters counts, in my opinion. You know, they changed the game so much. It used to be that way. It was always a hitters count so he could pick his pitch. Now you see more and more managers have them moving. And then the hitter has to more or less protect the runners. Right field, Carrasco is back and makes a relatively easy play. After one, no score, even though the Mets threaten. We'll be back after this from Calvin Klein. All right, Ralph. And this time, that is often the case Ryan, let's go. when these 
teams get together. Of course, uh, often in spring training, you have capacity crowds because the rarely will you find a stadium that seats more than 10 or 12,000 people. Ryan Klesko, the first baseman, is the batter. And he takes ball one from Doc Good. Those were Klesko's numbers at Richmond last year, the AAA affiliate of Atlanta. An organization loaded with talent, and uh, you mentioned Teresco with a possible heir apparent to the job in left field. Ron Gann is out of there. Klesko's another guy whose name has been mentioned. Ron Gant released by the Atlanta Braves last Tuesday. And an interesting story, as you see the new faces. <laughs> Our guys have coined them the four freshmen. They can hit the high and low notes, I would imagine. This one hit hard to second, dropped by Kent, and Klesko is thrown out. If we could put that graphic up one more time, guys, there's one guy where the, the big story uh, for the Braves the this spring eight, is the guy you Bobby saw first, Lopez. and that's Chipper Jones. And he is injured. And a fairly serious injury could be that uh, he will miss some of the early part of the season, and he was the heir apparent picked as the number one prospect for the Atlanta Braves. Only 21 years old, and among the three of them, Jones, Klesko, and Tarasco, they were supposed to fill the shoes of Ron Gant. But avoiding a tag at first base two days ago, Chipper Jones tore the anterior cruciate muscle that's in the front of the knee, below the knee, and he is in Atlanta right now and uh, undergoing an MRI, I believe on Monday, and uh, the fate of his season hangs in the balance. If they have to operate on Jones, then the job would be between Tarasco or Klesko, as Javier Lopez has finds the count one and one. Ball and two strikes to Lopez. Lopez, the young prospect, taking over as the number one catcher for Atlanta. But Greg Olson now with the Mets. He is the man that's heir apparent to the catching job. Both Greg Olson and Damon Berryhill with other teams now. Berryhill, the other catcher for Atlanta the last three years. Two and two now to Lopez. And the big story in the National League last year was Mike Piazza with that great year, the rookie of the year in the National League. And he's having a great spring this year, hitting 45 to lead all the hitters in the National League. Also has six home runs. Nice play by Pena. And Pena continues to impress. Two out. Fernando Vina. He was picked up by Seattle in the Rule 5 draft, and they couldn't keep him due to a roster clogging and returned to the New York Mets. And now a chance to make the Mets major league team. And he's a fine player, and he can play short, second, and third. You could see how he can play third with that play. You can see by his hat also that he's doing it the old-fashioned way. He's working harder. Sweat stains on the cap, a familiar sign here in spring training. Of course, during the season, if guys get their hats sweaty, they just change them, right? Right. Of course, I wonder if you did what we used to do in the service when you got some bars that were brand new. You used to soak them in salt water, so it looked like you'd been around a long time when you were a rookie. <laughs> well, Vina trying to earn his stripes with the Mets. Three balls and no strikes now to Lemke. Mark Lemke at second base for the Braves, and he takes the strike. Three and one from Doc Gooden, who has retired five in a row this afternoon. Hit hard through the middle. Bogar throws out Lemke. Gooden protecting himself. The ball is hit like a rocket. And Doc smiling, so he's all right. He's retired six in a row, no score, middle of the second. We're back after this from Bud Light. 
Good. Bottom of the second, Ryan Thompson leads it off for the Mets, and he promptly pops one up right side in foul territory as Ryan Klesko to make the catch. Thompson batting 257 on the spring, but on the first pitch, he pops to Klesko. One away here in the second, and Greg Olson coming up. Greg Olson. is one for 14 on the spring. Strike one from his old battery mate, Kent Merker. Yeah, there in his major league uniform the hard way. He started the season in 1990 in the minor leagues and then was brought up under unusual circumstances. Strike two to Olsen, nothing in two. Ernie Wood, who was a free agent signee, was a flop, so he was dropped. John Russell was released, another catcher. Phil Lombardi, who played for the Mets, retired. And Jody Davis, at the end of his line, was released. And then he made the ball club as the number one catcher. Sixth choice, number one catcher. And he capitalized on that. Ball and two strikes now to Greg Olson. Fouled away, one and two. Mets threatened in the first inning. They had three straight hits, but because Fernando Vina was hit on a ground ball by Rick Parker, Mets failed to score with those three hits. And the splitter is low. It's two and two now to Olsen. Between innings, Mike Cubbage, uh, interestingly, was talking to Rick Parker, 68, Fernando Vina, about that play. And uh, one would think that he's probably telling Vina to look, but keep your eyes on the ball, right, Ralph? Yeah, the batter's automatic. The runner's automatically out, and the batter gets credit for a base hit. And on the breaking ball, Olsen is down. Second strikeout for Merker. Two out, and Tim Jordan Bogart down. coming up. Number 23. That rule was Jim always Bogart. the scoring rule for years until Jackie Robinson one time went on second base, got hit deliberately, keeping the team from hitting into a double play, and they changed the rule. So if you do it deliberately, try to get hit by the batter ball and lose only one out, it is now a double play if you are caught doing it deliberately. If the ball's hit hard enough, all of those things would have to be taken into consideration. Umpire's judgment on the play, but Jackie Robinson, the man that brought about that rule change. Outside corner to Bogar, one and one. Tim enjoying a fine spring after playing 66 games at shortstop last year. Yeah, he's hitting 348 this spring. Eight hits and 23 at bats. Two balls and a strike. High ball three. Three and one to Tim Bogart. Tim trying to get on there to clear the pitcher. To have Vina leading off the third inning at the worst. Of course, in a sense, you don't uh, necessarily have to clear Doc because Doc can handle the bat as well as any pitcher in the National League. Three and two to Bogart. Strikeout for Merker. The Mets go in order. Five in a row for Kent Merker. No score after two. We'll be back after this. From Gooden to Bill Pakota is low. One ball, no strikes to Bill. Batting 280 on the spring with a home run. Check swing back to Gooden. Easy play for Doc. One away.
Doc will leave the Mets camp on Monday Good and time. visit Number his two. father, Dan Gooden, in are. Tampa. Dan will go into surgery on Tuesday, exploratory operation, and Dan and Ella watching the game today from Tampa, and our regards and hello from Doc and love from Doc. Raphael Belliard, the batter. And this one back to good. Two comebackers, two out. Eight in a row now, retired by Doc Gooden. The pitcher, number 50, Ken Merker. Pitcher, Kent Merker, the batter. Dallas Green, Greg Pavlik will try to get five innings out of Gooden this afternoon. I saw where Kurt Schilling, who is not having a good spring for the Phillies, went six yesterday against the Dodgers in a losing effort, but he did pitch well. First good outing for Schilling this year. Very impressive year last year. And the Phillies in the same division this year as Atlanta, Montreal, the Mets, Florida, and the newly restructured National League East. Ball and two strikes now to Kent Merker. For the third strike. So Gooden has retired nine in a row. We'll be back after this from Snapple scoreless ball game. We had a special meeting with Fred Wilpon of the New York Mets and some of the plans they have for entertainment at Chase City this year certainly are going to be outstanding. Be a lot of fun at Chase so get in on the early fun with those season tickets. Ground ball to second base. One away. And it's unusual to see a spring game moving as rapidly as this one has. Fernando Vina, who singled in the first inning, is the batter. Fernando Vina. And it's funny how in this game, what Dallas Green told us the other day about Vina is uh, coming to the fore. Dallas, uh, Gary Thorne and I were talking to Dallas down uh, near the Mets bullpen, the auxiliary field here in Port St. Lucie. As Vina pops it out of play, nothing won to Fernando. And Dallas telling uh, Gary and me that he had called Lee Elia and Lou Pinella of the Seattle Mariners and asked about Vina. Vina was with the Mariners until June of last year. And uh, uh, Dallas said that Elia and Pinella both said that they love the guy, that he, they think he can play, that Lou had to, uh, uh, got very upset with him uh, for three base running blunders. And this one hits Pena on the shoulder. Maybe the hand. It looked like the right shoulder. But anyway, today we've seen a fine defensive play, but we've seen a base running blunder on Pena's part. Here's the last pitch that hit Vigna. Right off the top of the shoulder, right near the shoulder blade. Ouch. Boy, that's something. That's serious up there. A little bit higher, and you got the head, so I'm checking him out. Yeah, the unprotected part of, of the neck and the Bruce Fremming, the first base umpire, uh, asking uh, Fernando, hey, make sure. No sense in, uh, and now Steve Garland coming out uh, for that same reason. Uh, if it hit on either side of the vertebra, you would think that he'd be all right, the, the muscle uh, lining the vertebra, but if it hits the bone, that is a nasty, heavy fastball that Merker throws. When a pitch is right at you, at the middle of your back or higher, it's almost impossible to get out of the way. 
But he appears to be all right. He's going to stay in the ball game. So Fernando appears to be okay, and Rick Parker, who singled by virtue of Vina being hit by the batted ball in the first inning, is the batter. Strike one. moving that neck around he appears to be all right Rick Parker will be 32 years old tomorrow <laughs> little looper down the right field line over near the line is Tarasco Tony playing Parker well and there are two outs with Kevin McReynolds coming up left fielder Kevin McReynolds Barring an injury, one would have to think that Vina is going to be uh, at least penciled in to go north with the Mets. Now, here's a guy who was uh, who was not on the well, he was on the roster, but he certainly was not expected to go north with the team. But Dallas Green, quite honest about Fernando, saying he hadn't seen him play, but he has certainly been impressive this spring as McReynolds grounds up the middle and Lemke over to Belliard for the third out. No score after three. We'll be back after this from Bud Light. Vina plunked on the shoulder, actually uh, right to, it appeared to the right arm side of the vertebra. He appears to be all right. He's back in there. His throwing doesn't appear to be impaired. And if you are uh, someone who is interested uh, in getting into the broadcasting business, you are going to listen right now to a guy whose throat is not impaired. One of the great voices in the game, Gary Thorne. Gary, you welcome. Have, thank you, sir. You haven't heard me yet today, though. <laughs> it varies from day to day. <laughs> Three hits put up by the Mets as they have stranded a couple all coming in the first inning. Since then, Merker and Doc Gooden have pretty much had their way. Gooden has retired all nine batters that he's faced back to the top of the order and now 100% baseball, at least for the time being, Deion Sanders will lead it off. He flied out the left field his first time out. Brown and Tarasco will follow. And the breaking ball in for a strike. Deion's having a great spring. He's been on base with base hits to a clip of 375. All 12 hits he's had this season have been singles. He's picked up three stolen bases in four attempts, so he's got that on. Takes the pitch on the inside corner for a strike. And Gooden ahead on the count 0-2. Doc, who struggled, of course, with control. We see that first out. He's come on strong. Olsen hangs on to the foul tip. And that's going to be strikeout number three for Doc Gooden. He struck out Merker to end the last inning and gets Deion Sanders here. Left field. And Doc's doing a good Jordan. job of mixing them up this afternoon. The fastball for the second strike freezes Sanders. And now the good curveball. Watch the break on the downer. And that ball actually looked like it was foul tip. And Olsen held on. Olsen didn't tag Sanders. No, it was. Yeah, I, th I think, uh, I think the Mets got, a got away with one on that one. Joe West indicated it was. But it, but it uh, hit the ground first. I thought so, too. <laughs> Ol Olsen came up nicely with the scoop. and uh, Right over Gooden's head and a base hit by Jarvis Brown, who had struck out his first time up. And there's the first base runner against the Mets' Doc Gooden in today's game. Solid single. Yeah, if a, if a batter foul tips the ball, right that's a general review right. for us right. much right. you folks. If he foul tips the ball, a catcher's got to catch it cleanly. Now watch the foul tip, and now the ball in the dirt. Technically, Sanders should have life, but uh, Olsen showing the ball to West thing. That was a clean pick, man. You see, that's why there have to be four umpires in a game. So yeah, that's right. There was that's no, exactly right. There was no umpire right. down at third base. Good point. So nobody had a clear view of that, and Olsen was not going to help anybody else. He just came up and said, hey, I had yeah. that all along. And mm -hmm. when you do that, you just throw it around, away we go. Yeah. And he got away with it. 
Tony Tarasco up, runner on at first base. Brown, who does have some speed, Gooden recognizes that. Puts him back on the bag as Brown has picked up a couple of stolen bases in two chances. And the left-handed hitter left the outfield playing him pretty much straight away, not too deep infield. A double play depth with one down. And Glenn Davis over at first base, holding him on. Here you see the positioning of the infield at double play depth. They swing in the infield a little on the left-handed batter to pull, but outfield stays straight away. Good crowd on hand here today. In fact, it uh, looks like full house. Bleacher seats down the line filled up early today. Great day to be out and see some baseball. A lot of Atlanta Braves fans have made their way up to the West Palm area to see the team. Big crowd on hand on a very beautiful spring day here in Florida. Rasco flied to left. Takes the pitch away for a ball. Atlanta Braves, of course, as I'm sure most of you baseball fans know, a tremendous loss in last night's play, yesterday's play. Chipper Jones is gone. The damage to a knee on a freak play at first base. The guy who was battling for Ron Gant's position. And I asked Bobby Cox before the game, what was Jones' status? He said, starting outfielder, batting third. Wow. Before the injury. Before the injury. Mm -hmm. And it was a freak play at first base, a routine ground ball, and he was going to first, and the throw drew the first baseman off the bag, and he tried to twist himself around it. Runner goes. Olsen had trouble getting it out of the mitt. Stolen base for Jarvis Brown, who's down at second now with one away, takes away the double play opportunity, and Brown's three for three in stealing bases. It's a bad combination uh, for the Mets, a breaking ball and a good jump. The breaking ball taking longer to get there and a good jump by Brown, a hurried throw that was non-existent by Olsen. So Tony Trasco gets the chance here for the RBI opportunity now. And he was fooled on that pitch, guessed wrong, took the check swing and fouled it off. Chipper Jones went into first base and kind of awkwardly went around the first baseman. And when he came down, he came down on the knee on the outside of his foot. They don't know whether the medial collateral ligament is torn or stretched or what, but it's a serious injury and the potential that he may be out for the year. I tried to get an answer on what they were going to do with it, but they didn't know before the game whether it was going to be something they were going to have to open him up on and operate or something they would just rest. So the outfield job remains open and the Braves got to wonder, maybe that's a spot nobody wants to play in. It's got yeah. bad karma. Well, it, it's, a, it's an interesting situation that they find themselves in now. I mean, the Braves with the wealth of talent, but now Otis Nixon signs with the Red Sox as a free agent. That means Sanders has to play every day, including against left-handed pitching. Gant has a broken leg, and now Jones is hurt. So what was a wealth of talent in the outfield have narrowed down to a precious few. Amazing how quickly that happens. Yeah, it is. There's the first walk. So Doc gave up the single to Brown. First hits. Brown's on his second having stolen it. Now Carrasco picks up the first walk, putting runners on at first and second. One out in the scoreless ball game. And Ryan Klesko, who grounded out his first time up, stands in. Klesko is the cleanup batter in this game for the Atlanta Braves. He's had one home run and three RBIs this spring. Gooden's fastball is up high, and Duck, who had very good control, particularly in that second inning, and into the third, struggling a bit here in the top of the fourth inning, as he's up high with it. First and second, one down. Brown with good speed at second base. Bogar holding him close from behind. The off speed breaking ball misses outside. Doc this season, of course, trying to work with the changeup. Develop a third pitch which he can use effectively in a game. Goff set the fastball and the curve. Duo delivery behind on the fastball, fouls it off down the left field line, and Klusko still ahead on the count, two balls and one strike. In the spring of 1963, for the first time in uh, my, I was only 21 at the time, but yeah. Robin Roberts was pitching against the Cardinals in St. Petersburg, and Roberts kept throwing to first base, and Johnny Keene, our manager, said that uh, Robin must be working on a new pitch. 
He was throwing the first base. That's one way to do and it. And I said, now wait a minute. If he's throwing the first base, he's got to be working on a fastball, right? He's not going to be throwing sliders or curveballs to first, trying to pick a guy off. So, I mean, that left me shaking my head. I just, you think that's I figured, the one pitch you might have had when he I got to the majors? Yeah. Huh? So, if he, so if he's working on that pitch and then he's coming home, should you look for fastball? I guess, <laughs> yes. I, I did not... Uh, <laughs> That so, didn't get that theory did not carry a lot no, of weight no. with me or a lot of the other guys. No, I can understand that. <laughs> Gooden with a two ball, two strike count on this 22 year old first baseman. Left handed hitter with power. Plus go waiting and Gooden misses with a fastball inside and the count is full. Three balls and uh, two strikes on Ryan Plesko. Runners at first and second. Pat Corrales hollering out instructions from the first base side as they're looking into the dugout to see whether or not they want the runners going here. But only one away. I think they'll be going. Gooden's not as much of a strikeout pitcher as he used to be. Doc thought so. And Checking plus, in, second. excuse me, Gary. And plus, in spring training, you want to work on technique. That's right. Just the technique of getting your team used to doing the right things and the things that you're going to be doing during the season. Brown at second, Trasco at first, they do go, popped up, shallow left field. Kevin McReynolds shades down. And the runners retreat. So Klesko took it 3-2, and he's 0 for 2 as he flies out. And Doc Gooden gets a tough out for that young cleanup batter. So bring up Javier Lopez, the catcher who grounded out. Klesko going back talking about what he was seeing at the plate. I asked Greg Olson about Lopez, this young catcher that got the opportunity, in fact, when Greg was injured, to come up and play with the Atlanta Braves last season. He got in only eight games. He's only 23 years old. Comes from Puerto Rico. Played in eight games, had only 16 at-bats. But they decided at the end of last year and into this spring that this was going to be their catcher of the future. And the future, apparently, is going to begin on opening day. Javier Lopez has got a good bat minor league batting average of 278 over some five plus seasons 59 home runs during those five years not a lot of power did strike out a lot compared to walks but Bobby Cox says that's what we've worked on this spring is to take more pitchers but the primary concern Bobby said for this young catcher is taking care of his starting pitchers yep that's the first priority the offense comes second the pitchers come first that's what he's trying to learn. That one down the line is foul. He fisted that one and almost had himself two RBIs. Lopez right off the fist. Sounded like that soft wood touch right there. Lopez will come back. One ball, two strikes. I'll tell you the one thing he's got going for him, Gary, is that he's breaking in with a team that has a lot of talent. So therefore, his breaking in is not a glaring factor. He's breaking in with a more established pitching staff, an older staff, a staff that for the most part is going to call their own game. And along with that, uh, I don't. I, they will nurture him yeah. as opposed for it being the other way around. Yeah, good point. That's yeah, an ideal situation. He really has yeah. a lot of anonymity this season. He, he's not the one everybody's going to talk about, mm -hmm. which is kind of surprising. Bow back when you think about it, because here's a guy who's going to handle one of the best staffs in baseball, yet probably will have little said about him outside of Atlanta as the season goes along unless he's just spectacular offensively because other people have the limelight. But this is a good one. This is a good young catcher. Charlie O'Brien has been around. He's going to be uh, maybe appearing today in the ball game with the Atlanta Braves. One ball, two strike delivery by Gooden and the breaking ball is a good one. He had him way out in front of that, just enough to foul it back and stay alive with a 1-2 count. No score, fourth inning. Braves getting their first hit this inning. Dallas had been doing some work around the minor league complex here for the first part of this game. He was inside for a while, now back in the dugout. Still some decisions to be made. The New York Mets for opening day, and a large part of that will depend on whether there are going to be some deals struck. One, two by Gooden. He wanted that one. Fastball that just missed inside as Doc went down into that familiar 
Crouch, when he wants a call, didn't get it. That's something uh, that Greg Olson's having Gooden do that you didn't see Gooden do a lot of in the past couple of years. Come inside to right-handers with two strikes on them. That had a pretty good movement, huh? Yeah. He got him. Struck him out with the off-speed breaking ball. Lopez has retired. Four strikeouts for Gooden. Two base runners left on. We remain scoreless. Now this word from Nobody Beats the Wiz. Great to have you with us. Fort St. Lucie, full house on hand on a First lovely man, day. Gary Barnes and McIver right now. And Ralph Kiner will be back in a bit with us here. White puffy clouds and lots of sun hanging with us. Kent Merker and Doc Gooden locked up in a good one. The Mets 0-3-0. Atlanta Braves getting their first hit on the single by Brown off Gooden in that fourth inning. Mets stranded a couple in the first. Might have scored. But Vena who let it off with a single. Was hit by a ball. Hit by Parker on a hit and run as he went to second base. The Mets ended up stranding a couple in that inning against Kent Merker. Davis, Jeff Kent, and Ryan Thompson. They'll be up for the Mets as we go to the bottom half of the fourth inning. Glenn certainly will never be able to say he didn't have a chance no matter what happens. He has been given the long look see by the New York Mets. May have kept himself alive the other day with a couple of long shots after Dallas Green had made an announcement in the clubhouse prior to the game that those who felt they were on the bubble had best move around to the side of it in a hurry because it was decision making time and Davis responded two home runs. He has two home runs, eight RBIs, but not a powerful average, seven hits picked up on the spring. He struck out his first time up against Kent Merker. No play on that for Lopez. Strike one. Question for the Mets right now. I, was, I happened to be out in Los Angeles here this past week and the J.T. Snow issue, the Angels' first baseman, mm -hmm. is uh, still under discussion with Anthony Young going the other way. Dallas Green will have to await that final determination on that deal in order to know just exactly what he's working with for position players. But the Angels are very high on Young. They really want him. Anthony has had a terrific spring. A guy who at one time over two years lost a major league record 27 in a row, but still a very sought after, sought after uh, pitcher. Lavesi was saying out there for the Angels, he thinks he can be one of their starters in a rotation they're looking to fill. Bill Lavesi is the grandson of Buzzy, is that right? That's right. Or, and son of Peter, son I Son of Peter. Right? Yep. And he's calling the shots on this one for the Angels. And Snow, of course, a rookie last season. He's got power. Play first base. A real prospect. So uh, the talks continue. Vania still hurting from that time he was hit by a pitch. As you see, it looks like it was right on the back of the neck. There's no way he's coming out if there's any way he can stay in. <laughs> there's a job on the line right. here. <laughs> right. I'm not going anywhere. You've heard that line, if it ain't broke, don't fix That's it. That's right. If it ain't broke, I'm not coming out of there. And even if it is broke, don't <laughs> fix it. Not yet. <laughs> Wait till I got the money so I can pay for it. Two balls, two strikes on Davis. A strikeout victim. In the first inning, Merker has struck out three. Gooden has four Ks in the game. 2-2 Two -two delivery. Off speed again. Popped up. Lopez coming back this time. Not quite on the screen. Gary, talking about uh, the deal, Anthony Young, or the uh, potential deal of Anthony Young for, for Snow, the first baseman of the Angels. Dallas Green certainly familiar with building a farm system. He was the farm director for the Phillies in the early 70s when Paul Owens took over as the as the manager of the Phillies. And Dallas went over and built the Cubs. But uh, Anthony Young with a pull to groin right now. It's going to take four or five days. So if you're the Angels, you're not going to make a deal until you know for sure that he's healthy. He got a hold of that one deep to left field. Back at the wall is Brown. He looks like he's not going to have room. Goodbye. Gets his third of the spring, Glenn a little help from the wind blowing right to left and the Mets have a one to nothing lead and his hopes remain alive.
maybe just spring training, but this is a huge home run for Glenn Davis. Every at bat on the line, nearing opening day, only a couple of weeks left. And you can see he was kind of jammed with that fastball from Merker. Brown goes up, but the ball goes down. Three home runs and nine RBIs now for Glenn Davis this spring. He's had a total of eight hits in 37 at-bats. Three of them have been home runs. That rocket shot into left field is going to be caught by Brown. As Jeff Kent is retired, he has slid out twice. He got good wood on that one. He hit it hard, but right at Brown, one away. Davis is showing what the Mets were looking for out of him. And that's power. A couple of doubles, three home runs, nine RBIs. He has struck out eight times and walked once. I think that nine strikeouts now in one walk, adding the one he had today. Those are his spring numbers. And with all of the spots the Mets have to fill, the success of one may mean the demise of another. If Glenn Davis makes it, Jim Lindemann, who led the PCL last year, may not make it. It's not that you're rooting for a guy to have a bad spring. You're naturally rooting for yourself to have a good spring. But uh, you realize, on the other hand, that it's very, very competitive. And if they take one, uh, they're not going to take you, or the possibility exists that they're not going to take both of both Lindemann and Davis. That's how camp started, and remains. Those decisions remain to be made. Ryan Thompson, who popped out his first time up, fouls that one off. Mets up one nothing. Their fourth hit, the home run by Davis. One down and nobody on here in the bottom half of the fourth inning. Ryan Thompson getting back into the lineup. 257 average coming into the game. One double, one home run for extra base hits among the nine he's had this spring. Kent Merker, the left-hander, shows some pretty good juice on that fastball. Two balls, two strikes. Ryan Thompson with a revamped batting style. He's more straight up and more open this year. Sandy Alomar Sr., for whom uh, Ryan played in winter ball over in Puerto Rico, said if you open up a little bit, you can see the pitcher with both eyes and not just one. So he straightened up. He was in a crouch, and he was much more closed. He, he's really funny when he tells the story. He said, uh, Sandy Alomar Sr. said, take your stance. So Ryan went into his stance. He crouched down. And uh, Sandy said, now try walking that way. <laughs> I've never heard that before. It's no, a great, he said, try walking that way. And so Ryan was walking around in a crouch. And he said, Don't you, wouldn't it, it better for you to walk standing straight up? There's a breaking ball line into center field. Deion Sanders over to get it. Ryan Thompson, who went two for three in yesterday's game, is now one for two in this one as he delivers a single in the Mets' fifth hit. The catcher. He also Ray runs better that way. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> but I, I'd never heard that uh, explanation, but he was fooled on that slider. A little double clutch and a base hit to right field, and that's what he was working on all winter, trying to hit the ball the other way to keep the shoulder closed. I, mean, I want to get a chance to look at that again. That was a pretty good piece of hitting by Ryan. Yeah, what? He stopped the swing. Mm -hmm. Little double clutch. Little double clutch and still able to drive the baseball out. One down. Thompson on at first base. And Merker facing Olsen. Well, what happens is uh, big, strong hitters, they don't realize how quick their hands are and how strong they are. I mean, that's not an ideal hitting position, but the reason it's not is because of the pitch and not because of Thompson. He was fooled on the pitch. The hands, even though they had come forward, were still quick enough and strong enough to line at the right center. I like that. You can hit the one you're fooled on. You're yeah, in real good shape, right? right? <laughs> right. Breaking ball, Lopez blocks it, keeps it in front of him, and Thompson will stay at first base. And the count is one ball and one strike on Greg Olson, who struck out his first time up. Catchers anticipate breaking balls in the dirt, and that's usually a rather routine play on the short hop that's close to the catcher. You gotta be able to make that one. You're gonna stay around. Right. Thompson over at first base draws the attention of Kent Merker. Thompson has not attempted to steal a base this spring. Another reason just to keep himself in good physical shape. Getting a pretty
pretty good lead over there. Plesko holding the bag on him. Mercer, of course, the left-hander looking right at him. And he misses outside to Olsen. Two balls and one strike. I have to give uh, Greg Olsen his due here. I, I kidded him in our pregame. Didn't give him a chance to respond. I was joking with him at the end about cutting his son's hair. And he didn't cut his own, so he looked good. And that's the reason he was complaining about his son's haircut was because he gave it to him. <laughs> but he told me that before we, we went on the air to do the interview. And threw it in at the end. He goes, oh, my God, my wife's going to kill me. 2-1 pitch has popped up. Shallow right second baseman, probably. Lemke gets over and makes the play, and Greg Olson is retired. The smart man knows enough not to cut his own hair, but saves money on his young son by doing Good it. Shot, Jim Bogart. And there are two down. Two down, and Thompson remains at first base, and Tim Bogar, a strikeout victim. Looking down at Mike Cubbage at third. There's, see, he looks fine. That's he does. That's the Olsen cut. <laughs> <laughs> now you said that. It's a good not thing me. he had his cap off during that interview. <laughs> <laughs> uh, two away. <laughs> I Looks think. like a catcher's haircut to me. <laughs> I wasn't going to say that either. I think he's still the only man in America who has one of those butch whack things. <laughs> yeah, he's still whack. You know, that butch wax, I used to have a crew cut until I was about, oh, 38. Yeah, yesterday. <laughs> uh, yeah, but you know, that butch wax stuff, that can last you for years. I mean, all you need is a little bit. You wonder how they ever make money. It's like you... you you know, I mean, you could put one of those butch wax and that thing will stay that way for, until your next shower. You know how many people? Through hurricanes and everything. <laughs> how many people out there going, butch wax, butch what wax? Is, what is butch <laughs> wax? Right. Uh, now, in today's politically correct age, we wouldn't be able to call that product by that name anymore. <laughs> They'd probably, probably think of something just sponsored by the Red Sox manager. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> one ball, one strike, two down. America will hold Thompson. Those of you, it was it really was wax, and those who had crew cuts used to put it on the front to hold the hair up in front. It was really ugly. I know because I had one. He's not using it. <laughs> one and one. Oh, Greg, he's gonna kill me. And me. <laughs> yeah, and you. you. You go first. Well, at least I got one free game interview with him. <laughs> Be the last. Run on five hits for the Mets. Bogart, again looking at Cubbage who goes through the signs. Bogart with a double on the spring, eight hits total, batting 348. Struck out only once and has picked up a couple of walks. Thompson at first, Merker's fastball just missed down low. Joe West getting the double look from Merker. And the count goes to three balls and one strike. There's Mike Cubbage third. up one nothing Glenn Davis the leadoff home run here in the fourth inning Thompson's going grounded down the third that is a foul ball just missed Bill West the home plate umpire makes the call See, that's what Ralph and I were talking about last inning and that in my opinion is the reason that 3-1 count with two outs and a runner at first is not a running situation the right-handed hitter in particular sees the runner run, and he's more inclined to swing at the ball off the plate. This is a fastball you don't know for sure, but it's a fastball that looked inside to Bogar, and in trying to protect the runner, he swung at a pitch that usually in an offensive situation he would take, yep. and it would be runners at first and second. Yep. Instead, the count is three and two on Tim Bogar. Ryan Thompson will not be held in the bag now. 3-2-2 two, two down, Thompson off, and the breaking ball misses inside. So he draws the walk, keeps the inning alive, putting runners on at first and at second with two away, and this is what Doc Gooden lives for. Howard going through the discussion of what happened on that 3-1 pitch in all likelihood. Hondo's not going to give up that opportunity to teach. All right, let's see if Doc Gooden can deliver and help himself. That's up, one nothing, two down. Merker gets the outside corner. Good and grounded out his first time up. Hit the ball hard to second base. Throughout his wonderful career, he's always been more than willing to talk about 
hitting over pitcher. Good in the 198 lifetime hitter. Fastball, he's behind on that one, and the count is two strikes on Doug. Getting ready for the opening day assignment. Thompson, a big lead at second base. Bogar off first, and Gooden again behind on the fastball. Up around the eyes that time, and the count remains at two strikes. Yeah, the Mets break uh, camp here in Florida. They go to Texas for two games to open up the new Ranger Stadium. We'll be on the air, by the way, on April the 2nd at 3 o'clock Eastern Time. On, excuse me, Gary, and then it's on to Chicago, and the Mets open on the 4th and open at home at Chase Stadium on April the 11th against the same Chicago Cubs. The Cubs are going to have a very good year. Yeah. I like that team. One of the few cl clubs is loaded with shortstops. 1-2 mm -hmm. delivery. Grounded down towards third. It's going to be a tough play. Makota, and he got him. Good play as Merker went out it and couldn't get it. Glenn Davis led it off with a homer. The Mets lead two. They've got a one nothing lead. Now this word from Coca-Cola. Some of the sponsors who are here on WWOR. This is a weekend for them to come down and enjoy some baseball. They are seated together and had a little softball game uh, before the spring I, game. And I have heard about this game, uh, but I also heard about this slide. Uh, not necessarily great throwing technique, but just a head first slide. I mean, possibly a, an audition for the silver bullet. Huh? <laughs> Got a shot at it. And it was a winner, too. Aren't the Silver Bullets the uh, ladies' yes. baseball team that's going to play about 50 games uh, uh, around the minor leagues? Which Necro is? Is that Phil is running that? Uh, Phil Necro Phil's will be it, the manager, right? right. The Mets do have a lead, by the way. We didn't take it away from them. Glenn Davis' home run. It's 1-0, 1-5-0 for the Mets. 0-1-0. Doc Gooden will go to work. And the breaking ball misses outside to Mark Lemke. Lemke, Dakota, and Belliard will be up. Mark Lemke grounded out. Doc's getting a lot of ground ball out. First four innings of this game. He's headed down low. And one ball, one strike as he catches the corner. One and one. Doc has struck out four. Retired the first ten batters that he faced before the single by Brown. With one down in the fourth inning. We are now in the fifth. Turned that one over and missed outside with it. Two balls and one strike. Fastball down the middle, but he missed down low. And he falls behind three and one on Mark Lemke. Lemke, the kind of guy winning ball player, winning teams have around. Good off-speed pitch as he took something off it on a 3-1 count. Lemke now 28 years old out of Utica, New York. He played some baseball along the way and came up with the Braves in 89. 234 major league average. Moves around in the middle infield. 3-2 delivery to left field. Kevin McReynolds. And still blowing out that way a bit. Max got plenty of room short of the warning track. Lemke's gone to start the fifth. He's 0-2, one away. Mack without the shades out there at the left right now. The Bill Pacoda. Clubhouse people have been running them in, in and out to the outfielders for both teams here this afternoon. Gooden. There you see how he has gotten the outs. Four strikeouts is kind of nice to see for Doc here today, not having any coming into the game. Starts out with a breaking ball on Bill Pacoda. Pacoda grounded back to the mound in his only other at bat. Doug missing with that one. Mike Maddox got some work today on the B game. He worked four innings, no runs and a couple of hits, walked none and struck out five, pitching against Ottawa on one of the other fields here today. So a good outing for 
Maddox. Two balls, no strikes on Sakota. Bill calls that one back. Two balls and one strike. I, I think the most important thing for Doc at this stage in his career is not whether to keep the ball down or up, but inside or outside. I think it's very, very important for the command of the inside and outside corner to be there for him to be effective. Got that one. Off the fist, McReynolds. Shades the eyes, two down, Pakota's retired, and he is old for two on the day. Six. I mean, when Doc Gooden uh, broke in, everybody would say, lay off the high fastball. You do not want to swing at the ball around the letters. That's the pitching and the strikeout. So, therefore, the hitters in the National League push the ball down. That's uh, Greg Pavlik, the pitching coach, looking on. But when the hitters push the ball down, that, mean, that meant that they were more selective with Gooden. So in order to combat that, and that's one of the good things about baseball is you can always combat the, the thing that's coming at you. In order to combat that, you have to start moving the ball inside and outside. Doc really doesn't have the luxury anymore of overpowering guys on a consistent basis, so he's got to pitch the spots a lot more than he used to. The control pitcher. One ball, one strike on Rafael Belliard, who grounded up. That's up 1-0. The top half of the fifth. Gooden stretching it out here today. Had a relatively easy time of it. Belliard grounds that one foul outside of third. So location and maybe the added change up pitch to keep hitters off balance is what we'll look for from Doc this season as to whether or not he'll be effective. I think so. The ability to get the breaking ball over, which he has. He, he retired Ryan Klesko on a 3-2 breaking ball earlier in the game in a tight situation. 1-2 delivery to Belliard. This is up high. It also started an informal count here, really, but I think three hitters with an off-speed pitch here today for a first pitch. So he's really trying to mix it up. Two balls, two strikes, two down. Good into Belliard. And he's gone. Five strikeouts for Doc. And again, as Timmy was saying, not overpowering, but just getting him off balance. A one, two, three inning. Mets up one. Nothing. Now this word from your tri-state Toyota dealer. For the day and a very successful outing. Congratulated as he came off the mound by Dallas Green. Pitching coach Pavlik and the players as he worked five. Gave up Playing one single strikeout five. Number 83. Did not Jose walk anybody. Braves did, all, did walk one, rather. The Braves had only two on, and those came in the fourth inning. So Doc has completed his work. Anthony Telford is the new pitcher for the Braves. As a matter of fact, the double switch. Anthony trying to make the Braves pitching staff, and boy, that is a large order. Trying to make this staff with four of the best starters in baseball, and a good fifth one, Kent Merker, had a good outing today, and a strong bullpen. But Telford, who was with Baltimore, obtained by Atlanta in the Rule 5 draft, the minor league draft, in there here in the fifth inning. Right-hander will go to work against Fernando Vena at the top of the order. has been on twice with a single and was hit by a pitch. Fouls that one off. Vena continues to put up some mighty and impressive numbers. Jose Almeida has come on to play at second base as Mark Lemke has come up. The pitcher and second baseman are the changes. The Mets up 1-0 on the home run by Glenn Davis, his third of the spring. And Vena takes it inside. Vena knows that leadoff spot is one everybody's talking about as far as the Mets are concerned. His on-base percentage just under 400 this spring with a 270 average. A couple of stolen bases. He's trying to show he does the things that traditionally a leadoff man's expected to do. Playing third base today with Bobby Bonilla resting the ribs and made a spectacular play earlier in this game on a hard ground ball that ended up foul territory behind the bag and he made the play at first and he gets another base hit wow pretty amazing story Fernando Vena on base all three times now two singles and hit by a pitch 
when you're on the bubble right like fielder, a player Rick like Hunter is the best thing you can do is come to spring training and open some eyes and he has certainly opened the eyes of Dallas Green the uh, main problem is where do you play him? is his arm strong enough for shortstop or do you dislodge Bonilla and or Kent out of third base and second base respectively there's a decision to make Parker down the right field line Carrasco moves over foul territory Vina tags up headed to second base great throw oh mercy Carrasco in foul territory down the right field line put it right on the money Rafael Belliard the shortstop had to wait for Vina to get there a double play two down Bobby Cox tells me that Tony Carrasco has the best arm in the Atlanta organization for an outfielder and he certainly proves it here but uh, the words of Lou Pinella echoing again uh, Fernando Vina has made two base running mistakes the first one glaring this one not so I think this one more one of enthusiasm if it can indeed be called a mistake but uh, he's been out twice on the bases today the first time when he was hit by a batted ball Kevin McReynolds now with two down and nobody on misses outside Telford behind on the count two and oh we've mentioned before it's the kind of play you probably see the Mets make this year they want to force things offensively they want to force the play of the other club try and catch the other team in mistakes and bad throws pick up an extra base here or there a different way of manufacturing runs in baseball is forcing the play and that's what we've seen them do this spring and Vina was trying to do it there make Reynolds one for two at a single his first time up in into a fourth play Ahead on the count, three balls and one strike. Back back with the Mets and get to see him out there in the left field. That one a little bit inside, and he was out in front of it. Rafael Belliard, the shortstop, calling for it, puts it away. One, two, three inning for Telford. Mets up one nothing. Now this word from Nissan. Gooden's completed his work, and Pete Shorick has come on. There are the numbers from '93. For the Mets left-hander. Stanets moved in behind the plate for a new battery for the Mets. There's Stanet doing the catching as Olsen has come out. The 0-1 delivery. Way out in front of that one. Almeida who's batting in the number nine spot. Parker's moved from right to left field as Kevin McReynolds has come out of the game and Jeremy Burnett has moved into right field. Parker, Thompson, and Burnett's in the outfield. Almeida getting his first at bat. And in the number nine spot to do it, he's playing at second base. Double A ball numbers for him from last year. 0 oh, 2 count. Pete Shorick again jams him and he fouls it off at the plate. For Shorick, this spring, he's working in his fourth game. Pitch nine and a third innings and has given up 16 hits and nine earned runs. He has walked three, struck out six. Opposition hitting 364 against him in his outings this spring. 0-2, he got it. Stayed inside. And Almeida becomes the first strikeout victim for Shorek. One down here in the top of the sixth inning. Center fielder, Deion Sanders. Sanders has gone 0 for 2 in this game. It's slide to left and struck out swinging. Doc Gooden without a strikeout coming in and uh, ends up leaving with five in the ball game. One down, base is empty, and Shorek, the bender over Leon Sanders' head. Ball one. Maddox, we told you, worked in the B game. He's come back and Icing down the arm and watching this one. Four innings for him with a couple of hits and five strikeouts, no walks. Two balls and no strikes on Deion Sanders. Controlling center field. Maybe we'll finally get a chance to see this season whether a full baseball year will be a productive one for Deion Sanders. He ought to be around for all of this one. Unless somebody starts a professional soccer league, he likes three balls and one strike. And he and Michael will buy it and go play on it, probably. 3-1 delivery. 
Shorik. Challenge is able to strike. The count goes to three balls and two strikes. Of course, a, a, a lot more of a parallel between uh, Deion Sanders and Bo Jackson because they played baseball in college. Michael Jordan hadn't played baseball since the high school days. He laid out for 15 years. What are those folks doing? Having a good time. I don't think I've ever seen that group <laughs> in unison in a ballpark. Kent over to Davis. And despite the speed of Deion Sanders, one away, uh, two down. Brother. Hey, by, by the way, I don't know if you uh, read the Chicago Tribune the other day. Bernie Lincecum, who is a terrific uh, left fielder, columnist Jarvis, for the Chicago yeah. Tribune, compared uh, Michael Jordan. He said it, it's not exactly like Michael Jordan's attempt to play baseball. It's not exactly like Elvis doing opera, even though he could. It's, it's more like Elvis taking up the accordion, <laughs> which he couldn't. <laughs> that broke me up. It was a great line. More like Elvis taking up the accordion, Michael Jackson, or Michael Jordan trying to play baseball. Uh, boy, has it generated enough ink and killed enough trees? That story, I'll tell you. Endless the watch that's gone on. Michael uh, Jordan, by the way, is two for 18, and none happier than Jeff Ennis, who gave up his first hit. And Jeff, in that great wit of his, said, I hope he gets at least one more. <laughs> <laughs> great line. Uh, the infield roller. That's right. It was off Jeff Ennis. Two down, and the base is empty. Glenn Davis, the home run of this game, has given the Mets the one nothing lead. That went over Shorek said, and a base hit for Jarvis Brown. So he's had a couple of singles. In fact, the only hits that are up there for the Atlanta Braves today have been picked up by the number two hitter, Brown. That one, the two down here in the sixth inning. Brown, San Diego last year, hit 233 in 47 games. He's on at first. And Shorek will face Tony Tarasco, who has walked and flied out to left field. Only two hits for the Braves in this game. York with Davis holding the bag takes a look. Tarasco goes after the first pitch. He's got a base hit. That'll sink in, making the turn. Brown, he'll go to third easily. He got the big jump and uh, first and third. With two down in the sixth inning for the Braves. Tarasco just went down and got it. And they're also in spring training form, getting ready for Fulton County. They've got a little work to do, but. They don't have the drummer here, so they're First baseman, not together. Ryan, hey, uh, unfortunately, and we talked about it earlier, that chop may take on a different connotation with Chipper Jones possibly undergoing the knife next week. Just talking to I.J. Rosenberg with the Atlanta Constitution who came in between innings, and he said uh, it probably will happen Monday or Tuesday. It's not official. It probably will happen. And if it does, it, it is the anterior cruciate, not the inside or the outside of the knee, but right below the knee in the front. And if it happens, if uh, he is operated on, it will be for the full year. Mercy. Not a good prospect for the Braves. Fine young talent. You really feel bad, Timmy, oh, for yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. here's yeah. a guy who had earned the spot, is going to bat third in one of the best lineups in baseball and play the outfield. And in a just one of those strange incidents at first place on a routine ground ball, twists his knee the wrong way, trying to get around the first baseman who's trying to tag him. Ryan Klesko, 0-2 count, runner at first, Shorek with a fastball inside. Two down, runners at first and third. Brown at third, Grasco at first, and the Mets leading it 1-0, and the Braves trying to tie it up or more here in the sixth inning. Klesko grounded out and fly to left field. 1-2 delivery to him. Tapped. Foul. at late. So Bobby Cox just thought he had his decision made and on the outfield position. It doesn't. Ron Gant did clear waivers, by the way, yesterday. Bobby, uh, as much as anybody, wondering whether somebody is going to be willing to pick up Gant and may be ready to play the second half of the season. 1-2 delivery. Missed outside. Two balls and two strikes. 
Why sign him now, though? Yeah. You know, why not wait yeah. until uh, he's ready and having uh, having examined? And obviously, he'll probably be going to a contender around the All-Star break if he's ready. Fouled off again. Unless, unless you're a team. Uh, but I mean, you know, let's face it. We're in a in the days of, uh, of fiscal responsibility, and you. Unless you're a team who wants to get the jump on another team to prevent another team from signing him and just take the chance, a team that could afford it like the Toronto Blue Jays. Yep. Whether or not you could do that without having to make a guarantee yeah. or not. Mm -hmm. Two balls, two strikes. Shorick working. First and third occupied with two down. That one, right center field. It's going to stay up in the air. Ryan Thompson comes over and puts it away, and Shorick gets out of the inning. No runs, a couple of hits, two left on. Mets still have the one nothing lead. Now, here's a word from your Tri-State Toyota dealer. Leading off the fourth inning off Kent Merker has given the Mets the lead. Mike Kelly has moved into left field. Jarvis Brown, who has a couple of the hits out of the ball game for the Atlanta Braves. And our old friend Dave Gallagher is going to do some work in center field. And Glenn Davis will be leading it off. Galley. And the fastball by Telford uh, is in for a strike. Glenn Davis, three home runs on the spring, got it off Kent Merker in the fourth. That struck out in his first at bat. He continues to be the power hitter this spring. Average just a little over 200. Breaking ball in the dirt, one ball and one strike on Davis. A lot of pressure for a ball player, especially a veteran like Davis, who knows this may be the last opportunity to come in and realize what he's got to do in order to make this team. Every at bat, every fielding play. And he's staying out there. He's at the top of the pile for the Mets this spring in at bats. Getting every opportunity. One ball, two strikes. Of course, if the Mets were to make some kind of a move and bring over somebody like Snow to play. They would also want other teams to have a look at Davis. So somebody else might be interested. The Mets weren't going to use him. One, two. Telford's outside with it. Two balls and two strikes. One, six, and zero. Oh. The Mets zero, oh, three, and zero oh for the Atlanta Braves. These two teams have played six times before spring training's over. Towering fly ball to very shallow center. Gallagher coming in will be called off. Jose Almeida will make the catch the second baseman. Davis is retired, and there's one away here in the bottom of the sixth inning. One for three for Davis. Fans want to remind you of the 29th annual Greater New York Mets Boosters Welcome Home Dinner is scheduled for Tuesday, April 12th. And if you'd like more information, chance to purchase tickets, you can call 718-507-TIXX. Always a great beginning to the season. Welcome home dinner for the Mets. Run by some wonderful fans, New York Mets baseball. Jeff Kent, 0 for 2, fly ball to right, fly ball to left. One down and nobody on in the sixth inning. Telford on for Merker, and that one's drilled to center. Dave Gallagher, long way to go. Kent really got a piece of that, but that's the deepest part of the ballpark. Gallagher stayed with it and hauls it in on the warning track. Maybe the best hit ball we've had in the ball game. One of the reasons that you don't see a lot of balls hit out to center field, out of the ballpark, and the other way is because the more you swing around, say a right-handed hitter, the more you go around from left to right field, the less the hitter has a chance to use his body, and the more he has a chance to use his hands. And of course, uh, added to that is that it's the deepest part of the ballpark. But when a guy pulls on a ball, you hear that expression a lot in baseball, he turned on it. Well, that means that he's using his body for the swing, and that's why most of the home runs that are hit are hit out when a guy can pull the ball as opposed to the center and the other way. That's where you have your greatest power. Right. In the right. body position. One ball, one strike on Ryan Thompson. Thompson one for two, a single in the fourth inning. Mets have stranded four. So have the Braves. 
Rays have left a couple in scoring position. The Mets won. Delford came in hard, high and inside, and got him to chase it. One ball, two strikes. Look how far Telford misses with this pitch. He's about a foot and a half from the target, but it's in an ideal spot to get anybody if they swing at it. That up and in pitch, the most difficult pitch to hit in the game, in my opinion. Then puts one up high and takes a little off it. Two balls, two strikes. Talk about getting your body in position. That's one. There isn't any position. Yeah, I don't think. right, right. Unless you start running out to the mound and hit it before he gets there. Or two, back two. up. <laughs> yeah, or back up. Got him again as he put that one up and away. And Thompson chasing on that one. A one, two, three inning for Telford. We've completed six here in Port St. Lucie. Mets lead at one nothing. Now this word from your Chrysler Plymouth dealer. Don't forget, The survival of the universe hangs in the balance. On the next Babylon 5. Wednesday at 8 on Channel 9. Jeff Maddow has taken over at first base for Glenn Davis, who leaves one for three with that home run that's given the Mets the one the nothing lead Hopper. with home runs. Oh, Ralph Kiner, perfect. All right, beautiful day, beautiful game, and the leadoff batter is Javier Lopez, who is 0 for 2 in the game, batting for the first time against Pete Churik, who worked the sixth inning, giving up two hits, but he's getting a very big out when he got Ryan Klesko to fly out to center field. One and one the count on Javier Lopez, who came into this game hitting 367 this spring with one home run, and he lines it down the left field line. Parker now in left field comes up throwing and stops Lopez at first base. Fourth hit for the Atlanta Braves. Tell you about Lopez earlier, Ralph. That's the way that's the way he's going to hit if he's going to hit. He's a line drive gapper once in a while. And not a lot of power, but good solid contact. They've worked on the cut to keep that upper cut out of the swing a little bit and get him to level it off. Out in front with his body, but able to pick it up with his hands as the breaking ball was lying to left field. That puts the potential time run at first with no one out. And Mark Lemke, the batter. And it's totally Graf Anino, who is batting for Mark Lemke. Tony Graffanino. Mets not looking for the Atlanta Braves, I should say the first place Atlanta Braves to sacrifice in this position. There's a call strike. against the runner at first base. Short lead there by Lopez, and the ball hits the third, and it should be a double play. There's one and the other. Slovenia turns the hard hit ball into a double play as Kent is the middleman, and Jeff Manto gets his first put out. Ralph, he can't do anything wrong. Uh, Slovenia's made one spectacular play throwing from foul territory. This time a little trouble. He was playing in close off the grass, but recover to make a good throw to second base. They turn the double play, and the kid just continues to sparkle no matter where you put him. Remember, he's never played third base before. And now the batter, Bill Pakota, and he takes the first pitch for strike one. Bill is 0 for 2 in the game. Former Mets player, he was acquired from Kansas City along with Brett Saberhagen. And last year going to the Atlanta Braves doing a fine job as a utility ball player for Atlanta. A ball call for ball two, two balls and one strike. And this ball hit to the shortstop side. Bogart short over to first to Manto and after the single and double play, the side retired. One hit. And the score at the end of six and a half innings. The Mets won in Atlanta nothing. And here's a word from Bud Light. Mets leading one nothing on the home run by Glenn Davis back in the fourth inning. And a new pitcher in for Atlanta. Pedro Borbon. There you see the numbers at AAA baseball last season. Left-hander who can 
throw the ball hard. You see the strikeouts that were picked up. 95 of 42 walks and 71 hits. So somebody that can come in late in the ball game and do some of the save work. Borbone getting the opportunity here. Graffino who came on as a pinch hitter is going to stay in and play at second base now. Michael Mead is moved over to third base for Prakota. He was playing second. Jose Almeida at third. And the first batter is Jeremy Burnitz, and he takes his first pitch for ball one. Burnitz batting for the first time, came into the ball game, taking over in right field. So far this spring, he has been up 35 times with seven hits. Two of them have been home runs. He's driven in six. First time we've seen him on our television broadcast. And the count now one and one as Pedro Boban, the son of Pedro Boban Sr., who pitched in the major leagues, mainly with the Cincinnati Reds. Burnett's showing Bunn again. It's two and one. the count to two and two. I think there's a, either a refugee ball that just arrived or a party that's about to begin. <laughs> Look at that cast of characters. <laughs> Rob, you got shirts like that, right? You, you got those. No, I gave those all to Lindsay Nelson. <laughs> A 2-2 pitch to Burnett has taken outside, so now the count full. Corbone, now 26 years old, has spent most of the six years he's been in pro ball in the minors. He's worked only five games at the major league level all his career with the Atlanta Braves. And the fastball fouled back out of play. Full house here today on a perfect day for baseball. Very, very warm. Temperature in the low 80s. Always the breeze blowing here. And that's ball four. So Bourbon walks his first batter, and the Mets have a runner on with Tim Bogar coming up. Shortstop, Tim Bogar. Bogar has struck out and walked in his two appearances. Came into this game hitting 348. He's now Eight for 24 at 333. And Bourbon over to first base. Burnitz. And one time a 30 30 man in the minor legs. 30 home runs, 30 stolen bases. He has not been able to use the stolen base side of this game in the major leagues. And the pitch to the plate grounded foul by Mike Cubbage, the third base coach. Mets this spring for the record of 10 and 8. The Braves have won 9 and lost 6. Third meeting between these two clubs. Each team has won 1. Casey just joined us. Doc Gooden, the starting pitcher for the Mets. A brilliant five innings. One hit, five strikeouts, one walk. His first good outing this spring. Again, the first. Ken Merker, the starting pitcher in this game for Atlanta, worked four innings, gave up one run on five hits. Three of the five hits coming in the first inning. Home run by Glenn Davis. Fastball for a ball. Telford, who's trying to make the staff, came on for Merker, did a pretty good job, two innings. One hit, struck out one, didn't walk anybody. Kept the ball over the plate as he battles for a spot of middle relief. Runner goes. The pitch grounded to third base. No play at second. Over to first base is Graffinino, who has taken over at third, and he gets the out at first. But on the hit and run play, the Mets get a runner in scoring position and stay out of the double play. Number 33, Kelly. Burnett's had a real good break from first base. Bourbon was 
not looking. He hadn't taken much of a lead on the previous pitches, and then when he was going to be running, he edged his way off, taking that walking lead a little bit. Protected the runner by staying on top of that ball. You see, he was already down at second base by the time he'd come up with it at third. And then I'll bring up Kelly Stinnett, who's batting for the first time, taking over the catching for Greg Olson and the first pitch ball one. The net hitting 313 this spring with five hits and 16 at bats. No home runs, two runs batted in. This one hit hard to left. This will be extra bases. He got all over that one. One bounce off of the fence in center. Coming in to score is Bernitz. And the Mets have taken a two to nothing lead as Stennett gets his third RBI of the spring. What a rocket. That was that was a line drive hit so hard it well, came off the wall, which isn't very high out there in left field, about midway up. One of those drives that barely came down by the time it got to the wall, and there was no chance for Mike Kelly out there in left field. He played in a little bit, see it right down at the base of the wall and died there on him. So Stanets the RBI with Stanets coming across. And now the batter will be Fernando Vina, who is two for two and also has been hit by a pitch ball, and he takes for ball one. Mets now leading two to nothing as they bat in the bottom of the seventh inning. We have Doc Gooden, Gooden standing by uh, after a very strong five innings of work for the New York Mets. And we're going to have a little conversation with him. And that pitch outside in the count ball, 2-2-0. Two, two and, oh. and, Doc, you got to feel good about today. That felt good, uh, Ralph. And the main thing, you know, getting ahead in the counts where the previous starts, I was kind of struggling high with the fastball, but just really concentrating on driving through, you know, sitting back on the bike leg, and, and that worked for me today. Good curveball to go along with your strong pitching, and he threw the change a couple of times, too, huh? Yeah, the change is one pitch I've been working on, you know, real hard this spring. Uh, in the past, I worked on a little bit, but once the season started, it was always pulling the bike burner. But this year, I really, you know, plan on using a lot. And uh, like you say, the breaking ball is coming along real well as, also. Doc, looked like you let off a couple of hitters with off-speed pitches. You're going to do more of that this year and mix it up? Yeah, I think I think you have to because uh, after being around for a little bit, you know, the hitters started to do their homework on you. And a lot of times by being a predominantly a fastball pitcher or a power pitcher, they literally look to jump on you that first fastball. So I'm looking to change speed a little bit more. The first pitch as well as once in a while when I'm behind in the count. One of the interesting things about your career with the New York Mets, of course, it's a fantastic career with the Cy Young Award and doing things no other pitcher ever did in his freshman year in baseball. That's ball four to Pena, and he joins the net on the bases, runners at first and second with one man out, and that'll bring up Rick Parker. Left fielder, uh, Parker. No Mets pitcher has ever been a pitcher that has developed a split-finger fastball while pitching in the major leagues for the Mets. Has that ever come into your thinking about going to the split-finger fastball? I thought about it a little bit. Uh, you know, last year, I wasn't really throwing a split-finger fastball, but once in a while when I tried to change up, I split the fingers a little bit, and it crossed my mind a little bit, and... Uh, you know, you never know. We'll see how the chain that works out. Uh, if that don't work, and then maybe I'll go through the split or maybe even try a slider. So I'm just searching right now. One of the things that's interesting, that split finger has been the savior of so many pitches that really needed the third pitch or even a second pitch to stay in the major leagues. And Mike Scott comes to mind as the man who really turned a average career into a brilliant career with a split finger fastball. Oh, that's true. You know, you take the chance. I think if uh, I start losing more of my fastball or struggling with the breaking ball, it would be a pitch where I would consider it, you know, think about going to. Uh, but I'm, I'm thinking at the same time, when a pitcher starts throwing it, and the one pitcher come to mind is Ron Darlin, where he threw a good fastball early in his career, and he went to the split and had pretty good success with it. And uh, I think it took away from his fastball a little bit. So it can help you, but then again, it can work against you. That's a good thought process there. Two balls, one strike to Rick Parker, who has an infield base hit and three at-bats in this game. And the curveball called a strike, two and two. wonder whether or not, Doc, do you subscribe to the theory that 
is a pitch that hurts your elbow or arm as you throw more of that split finger pitch? I think so, because you look at the uh, Giants staff that they had in the past when uh, Roger Craig was there, not knocking Roger Craig at all, who I thought was a you know, good manager as well as a pitching coach, with, but he had all those guys throwing a split finger, and all those guys you know, spend a lot of time on a DL. Uh, so, you know, I think it depends on how you use it, and once you become, you know, using it, you know, pretty often as a number two or three pitch, I think eventually you will have some problems. And a fly ball hit out the left center field, deep left center field. It'll drop into the alley there. The net comes in to score, and behind him, trying to score is Vigna, and the throw the play is not in time. So the Mets get two more, and they take the lead by a score of four to nothing as Parker doubles in two. Well, the Mets tearing up on Barbone is falling behind on the count this inning, and that has been his problem. Ending up at third base is Parker with a couple of RBIs in his second hit, as he's credited with a two for four day. Probably will end up with a double on this one. That pitch right there in the strike zone as he came in to get him, and he launched it. The outfield was playing fairly shallow on him. Kelly had a long way to go to get to it. Senior never hesitated. Mike Coverage waved him around on the relay throw from short. Nowhere near in time. Couple of RBIs. And that'll bring up the pitcher, Pete Shurek, and the Atlanta Braves looking for the sacrifice. And there it is. The squeeze play is on. The play to the plate. Not in time. So Parker comes in to score, and the Mets now lead it by a score of five to nothing on the fielder's choice and the sacrifice. Well, they were playing in, looking for the pitcher to bunt, but not only that, the base runner Parker got a tremendous jump as Bourbon, I think, lost sight of the fact the squeeze could be on, and uh, he was well ahead of the throw. No chance for the plate to be blocked that time by Lopez, and the Mets, hey, they put it off the wall, put it out in front of home plate, and have scored runs here this inning. That'll bring up Jeff Manto batting for the first time. Manto taking over at first base for Glenn Davis, who drove in the Mets' first run with a home run. Davis was one for three. And, Doctor, it's nice to see you have that great outing. It's uh, probably an opening day assignment for you against Chicago. You like to pitch against the Cubs, don't you? Yeah, I like it. Uh, not particularly in Chicago, but I'll take it. I mean, I've had good success against them, but uh, pitching in Chicago, I've won some games 8-7 or 9-8. I mean, they've all been great there. But, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to opening day, but I still have some work to do here. We're looking forward to that, and thanks a lot for dropping by with us, and uh, we'll talk to you a little later. All right, thank you, Ralph. You're Dwight Gooden, and uh, having a great outing here today. It really was impressive, coming in with no strikeouts, and uh, and the off-speed pitches he used to pick up the Ks in this game, as he ended up with five. Jeff Mano, the batter, with a count of 3-0, and, oh, and he takes that pitch for ball four. Mano keeps his average at 3.08, but two home runs and five runs batted in as he walks. That moves Shurik down to second, and it'll bring up Jeff Kent, and now a trip to the mound. Leo Mazzoni, the pitching coach, is on his way out. Bourbon has walked three in this inning. He's gotten behind hitters, and then when he has gotten it in, Stanett picked up the RBI double. Parker, the two RBI double. The base runners that he's walked, two of the three have already scored in this inning, and that's Bourbon's problem. He can strike people out throughout his minor league career. He's, he struck out a lot of folks for innings pitch, but he's not been able to take control of the plate. He's also given up a lot of walks, and that's why he not been able to move up to the major league level at the age of 26 triple a last year 52 games 95 strikeouts 42 walks that'll get you in trouble and he'll now have Second to work with Jeff Kent who's hit the Kent. ball well two of the three times he's been up lining out the left field and flying out the deep center and hitting 323 coming in with 10 base hits and the first pitch Ball one. Ralph, worthy a note, Fernando Vina now, that walk he picked up in this inning, he's been on base all four times. Hit batter, single, two singles and a walk. Scored a run. He's been caught twice in the base pass. He's made two outstanding plays at third. <laughs> he's had a highlight day of some sorts with a couple of lowlights in it on the base pass. But the errors that he made, errors actually of 
Russell more than anything else, and that's at least a plus on his side. And the Mets certainly need a leadoff batter. They have none in their overall plans, and he would be a man who could be the leadoff batter for the Mets, especially getting on base as often as he has. And that pitch taken for ball three, three and zero, oh, and Bourbon having all kinds of difficulties working to his eighth batter in this inning. As the Mets have scored four to break the ball game, their way five to nothing. Bottom of the seventh inning, and the 3 0 pitch is in for a call strike. Kent looked like he had the green light on that one, but took the pitch wisely as it was not a good pitch to hit. The secret to hitting when you have the count in your favor is to make sure you get a pitch that you can really hammer. And he did a good job there. And he takes that pitch for ball four, and that will bring up the ninth batter in this inning. That's gonna, they're actually gonna pull him, Ralph. Four walks in this inning, and Bobby Cox makes one of those rare spring training trips to the mound. Barbon just, he got himself in trouble immediately in this inning with the walk, leadoff walk to Burnett. Stanett had the RBI double. He walked Vania, putting two on for Parker, who delivered him with a two RBI double. Then the single by Shorick on the bunt, squeeze play. Not a good outing. And he better not send his laundry out because that could mean a trip to the minor leagues with that performance. A walks would be the one thing that would do him in. And we will be back right after this word from Tri-State Ford. nothing the Mets as they continue seven, here in the seventh line. inning. Mark Waller's the new pitcher. This 24-year-old has got some hump on the baseball out of Holyoke, Massachusetts. See the numbers he put up last season called up on June 4 with the Atlanta Braves. Ended up appearing though in 46 games. He kept the hits under innings pitched and the strikeouts well over walks. Hard thrower. He's been clocked at 100 miles an hour at one point in his career. And the first pitch to Ryan Thompson, the fastball, and it's pulled way foul by Thompson. We have a pinch runner for Jeff Kent, Luis Rivera, running for Kent. And the Mets have the bases loaded with one out here in the bottom of the seventh. They've already scored four, and they lead it by a score of 5 nothing. back for the double play. This ball fouled off to the right side. It might be playable. Pesco is over there. He loses sight of it and it drops into foul territory with no one there. He almost got hit on the head by that ball. He was begging for help from Tarasco, the right fielder, as he lost it. But he kept running and he ended up running right underneath the ball. It ended up about two feet away from him and he had no idea where it was. He might have broken his glasses there, checking them out right now. He's got the flips. He may have. Maybe he's just having them cleaned off. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least it gives him something to say. That's why I didn't see it. <laughs> it's a reason. I'll never forget the time that uh, Dow Maxwell hit a fly ball to right field. Ron Svoboda was playing right for the Mets, and he, he lost sight of the ball. It dropped in and went for an inside the park home run. And Ron came in. He said, I lost it in the sun. The only problem was it was a cloudy day. There was no sun at all. <laughs> but if there had been, <laughs> maybe he would have lost it in the sun. <laughs> he had a great excuse, but it was the wrong time. <laughs> you got to use those in the right places. <laughs> Here's a replay of that foul ball. It was way up in the air, and, the, and it was curving over towards the seats and towards that tarp. See, he lost it right there. Where's it? Watch. Whoa. <laughs> I think <laughs> Carrasco said, look out. Yeah, he's got to put his <laughs> arms up over his head. Carrasco is charging in from right field, but he had no chance of the ball. And Costco will just assume that we didn't show that again. <laughs> There's another one that you won't be able to interview. <laughs> I'm losing folks left and right here today. we down to working with Tim and me. <laughs> oh, just interview each other. That's right. <laughs> one ball and two strikes to count. Thompson the batter. Mets have the bases loaded, leading five to nothing. One man out. Bottom of the seventh inning. And that one's on the outside corner. Thompson takes the fastball. 
And it's the second out of the inning. You could hear that one coming before it got to the catcher's mitt. Waller's 45 strikeouts in 48 innings last year. And Ryan Thompson, he was behind on the fastball a couple of times. And that one, he thought, I think, was a little high, maybe even outside. But call given by Joe West, the home plate umpire. And it'll be Jeremy Burnitz to bat for the second time in this inning. He was struck out in his first appearance, and he has the check swing, strike one. Ten men to the plate for the Mets as they have scored four here in the bottom of the seventh inning. Bases loaded. Burnitz takes the fastball just off the plate. And it's a ball call. One ball, one strike to Jeremy Burnett. Waller's back, and again he tries a fastball for ball two, two and one. And Waller's, like Bourbon, previous pitchers, had his problems over the years with control. At 6-4, 207 pounder, a huge guy, and generally you get these pitchers of that size have a hard time establishing and maintaining a constant release point. And controls a problem at times. And he throws a fastball that Burnett fouls back into the stands on the third base side. He was behind that one, and the count two and two. Well, he's tough to catch up on, isn't he? He gets up there in a hurry with that fastball. He was used by the Braves last year as he was brought up from the minor leagues as a starting pitcher and did a good job filling in. And that fastball in there called strike. So Wallers goes to especially the fastball, picks up the strikeout. That leaves three on, but the Mets score four. And the score at the end of seven is the Mets five. The Atlanta Braves nothing. We'll return right after this message. presentation of RoboCop, the series, tonight at 8. Well, fans, get your season tickets now. This is the time to do it. We've got lots of great locations and special ticket plans to suit every schedule on every budget. For groups of 25 or more, there's plenty of group seating and pregame party packages as well. For all your ticket needs, call the Mets Ticket Office at 718-507-TIXX during business hours. That's 718-507-TIXX. And fans want to remind you to come up to Shea for a very special opening day. Note, April 11, the Mets will open their 94 home season. A 140 game against the Cubs, kicking off their year-long celebration of the 25th anniversary of the 69 Mets. And all fans in attendance will receive the first of a 510 69 collectible series from Chemical Bank. And members of the 69 Mets will be throwing out the ceremonial first pitch. So. Give a call for tickets at 718-507-TIXX. Also, they'll be happy to give you some schedule information, but it's April 11, 140 at Shea. And Luis Rivera, who was the pinch runner, stays in at second base, replacing Jeff Kent. As we go to the top of the eighth inning, the Mets leading by a score of five to nothing. Pete Jurek, who came in the ball game, Relieving Doc Gooden came into the game in the sixth inning. And in two innings work has given up three base hits. Raphael Belliard will be the leadoff batter. Belliard 0 for 2 playing shortstop. Former Pittsburgh Pirate infielder. And he goes after the first pitch, chops it out to Vinya at third, and a quick out. I don't know. Can I say any more? <laughs> he's done a good job. He man. has. I mean, he's gone. He made the long throw in foul territory. He turned the double play when he was playing in. This time he goes towards the shortstop hole, and he was playing in again. Shows a pretty good arm. Made that strong throw deep in the hole earlier in the game. Maybe most important, Ralph, he doesn't seem to be phased by anything that's asked of him this spring. I mean, he just is ready to go out and do it. 
and mentally isn't isn't bothered by any position or in the lineup or in the field. Well, that figures he comes from Sacramento, California. That's the capital of California. You got to be able. There to, you go. Can't be phased by any situation. Perfect. I knew there was an answer. <laughs> the two opits to Jose Almeida. And it's ball three. Omeda batting for the second time was struck out his first time up. Played at Richmond last year, hit 235 with 21 home runs in 125 games. And there's the strike, three and one. He was with Texas and was in the Charlie Liebrandt trade that saw Liebrandt go to the Rangers. The three and one pitch. Line, drive, base hit. So Omeda jumps on the fastball, the cripple pitch, and singles. And that gives the Braves their fifth hit in this ball game. Center fielder. He played at a great ballpark in New York down there in Richmond, the Diamond. But I remember the old ballpark that was one of those old wooden stadiums. And I did AAA baseball. What a wonderful place to watch a baseball game. And when they built the new park, they put out one of the best baseball posters I've ever seen. A black and white of the old ballpark with hot dog wrappers being blown around in it. And the logo on it. His diamonds don't last forever. I played in that old ballpark. What a great yard. I think uh, Abner Doubleday played in that old ballpark, too. That Boy. was really something else. Yeah. And now the batter taking the next delivery. Two balls, no strikes. Dave Gallagher batting for the first time. Dave, of course, with the New York Mets last year. And he grounds this one foul. Gallagher this spring, 7 for 33, hitting 212. He has no home runs, three runs batted in. And he will be one of the candidates for the left field job. Left open when Ron Gant was released by the Atlanta Braves. As Gary Thorne pointed out earlier, he cleared waivers, which means a ball club could pick him up for $1. High fly to left field. Parker now in left field, and he makes the catch in the edge of the warning track. So two men away. Left fielder, number 25, Mike Kelly. We made it back to first base, and the batter is Mike Kelly. Kelly batting for the first time, and he hits it to third. Vania over to the second baseman, Rivera, for the force play that ends the inning. One hit, one left. The score at the end of seven and a half innings. The Mets five, Atlanta nothing. And here's a word from Bud Light. Bottom half of the eighth inning, the Mets leading five nothing. And for the New York Mets, the leadoff batter will be Tim Bogar, who is 0 for 2 with a walk. Mike Wollers, who pitched the two batters in relief, came into the game with the bases loaded, struck out his two batters to end the inning after the Mets had scored four. And Wollers' next pitch after the ball chopped out through the middle. Tough play, and it goes on through in the center field. So Bogar singles as he leads off here in the eighth inning. The catcher, Kelly. Lee Heath, wearing number 89, is not a wide receiver. He's playing in center field, and Hector Rojas has come on to play at short. So a runner on with no one out, and Kelly Stinnett, who doubled in two runs, batting for the second time. The net doubled in the left field, the drive in two for the Mets, and he fouls off the fastball. Mets now have out hit the Braves nine to five. Mets with an interesting spring. They got off to a slow start, then had a string of seven wins in a row, and now with a record of 10 and eight. Waller's next pitch, a hard slider for a ball, one ball and one strike. 
I guess today we're out certainly Vina getting the start at third with Bonilla still having the rib coverage getting on base all four times a couple of singles hit batter makes it interesting Glenn Davis keeps it interesting delivering his third home run stories that continue yeah Dallas Green trying to put the jigsaw puzzle together and it's going to be very complex because if they do play Pena in the infield. There's a possibility Kent would go to third. Bonilla then would go either the first base or the outfield. Outfield if Glenn Davis makes it. If he doesn't, he would probably go to first base. It's going to be very complex. And that ball off of the glove of Lopez, and we'll see whether that scored a pass ball or a wild pitch as Bogart goes down to second. And if they make the trade and somebody like J.T. Snow comes over, that's we put him at first. That's a interesting spring. This one should have been handled. Lopez just was a little short and coming up in a hurry that time. Well, that ball comes to the plate in about two fifths of a second. He's got to get out of that crowd so awfully quick. Yep. There's the curve and it's in the dirt. Two and two the count. Kept rising on him and he wasn't ready for it. With Waller's on the mound and you're behind the plate. You don't do a Tony Pena and sit back, <laughs> sit back on your legs, I'll tell you that. That is for sure. <laughs> you're never quite sure where it's gonna go. If you did, the umpire might umpire <laughs> from behind the pitcher. That's right. <laughs> self-preservation ground ball to the first base side fielded by Klesko and he goes to the bag to make the play and on the out Bogar goes over to third base now Stadette should get some high fives when he gets back to the dugout this is late in the ball game he's not working on just trying to manufacture a run he's working on things that should be done during the season he had to move the runner up that time from second base over to third because now there's only one out and he did it and he intentionally made sure he got the ball the other way. No one will ever note that hereafter, but he did what he was supposed to do. The manager will note that. Yeah. Fernando Vena, the batter, and he's had a perfect day. He's been on base all four times. He has been up two hits, a walk, and hit by a pitch ball. The infield in for a play at the plate, and the breaking ball in for a call strike. That's a situation where I've long favored giving the official score the right to call that a sacrifice. You actually do sacrifice yourself. But unlike a bunt, usually the bunt is you're not going to get a hit. For play at the plate, and they'll get the runner. Bogart trying to score with the infield in is thrown out as Pakota comes home with it. And on the fielder's choice, Vania is on base for the fifth time, but this one is not credited. Left fielder, it would be a time Parker. at bat, not credited on the plus side. Had him played well in, and there's just not no chance to do anything at the plate. Lopez was able to block the plate as well. But he's just a goner. And that'll bring up Rick Parker. Parker with a double to drive in a big run for the Mets. He also has had an infield hit, so he's two for four in this game. Five nothing Mets, bottom of the eighth inning. Two men out, and Waller's back with a breaking ball in the dirt, a block, a good block by Lopez, and Pena has to hold at first base. Lopez has shown us, while well, he may have missed the one going up, that he can get down in front of it, see him protecting that bare hand behind him, but he gets the body in front, which is what a catcher's supposed to do, not play it with a glove, but with a body, and he moves pretty well both ways. Mania, a big lead. He does not go on the fastball for ball two. Two balls and one strike. Another big lead at first base by Venya. He does run, and the pitch is taken. The fastball thrown into the dirt at second base. It glances off of 
the shortstop covery that is fielded by the second baseman. So stolen base for Benya, his third of the year in this spring training season. He's three for four now. He had Wallers looking over at him. In fact, he was forcing the pitcher to deliver a little quicker than Mike Wallers really wanted to. Lopez, who has the good arm behind the plate, it's a good one to throw on as he was coming up on it anyway, but he buried that one in the dirt. But Vania, look how close he was to the bag when the throw got there anyway. And he's had a real good jump. Would have had that stolen. Three won the count to Parker, and he fouls off the fastball. Well, you like to have a guy in the lineup who makes things happen, and, and Vania's proving to be that kind of a player. He's, his, when he's out there, his presence is just always to be noted by the other team. He's always doing something. Presence of speed in a lineup. And again, the fastball, and again, it's fouled off. Parker's average for the spring is 308 with two home runs and 12 runs batted in. Trying to make this ball club a non roster player, and he lines one to left for another RBI and another base hit. Pena comes in to score the throw to second base not in time and the Mets lead it by a score of six to nothing and Parker comes up with another one and another player who's going to make the decision stop Vania with a stolen base helping to set up the RBI as he was off of course with two down and running and Parker now has two doubles a single that's his third RBI and he has scored a run. He waited on the Wallers breaking ball. You don't get a lot of those from Mike Wallers and he pulled it. That'll bring up Pete Shorek and Pete takes the fastball. It's off of the glove but Parker holds it second. Shorek got an RBI and a squeeze play in his last at bat. Brought one home. Parker was on third at the time. Laid down a real good bunt. Run scored easily on the squeeze. And Shurik takes for ball two, two balls and no strikes. That'll make him a believer in Bobby Valentine and the rest of the pitching staff. Bobby, one of the better coaches when it comes to a number of areas, and one is bunting. Valentine knows how to put the ball down and knows how to teach it. He's worked a lot this spring with pitchers doing that. And the pitch taken for ball three, three and oh. A lot of people complain that bunting's a lost art, but bunting is much more difficult to pay. The artificial turf makes the ball much liver and it's hard to deaden it when you are bunting. And also the rotation player, the wheel play with the third baseman charging, second baseman going to third, makes it more difficult there. That pitch for ball four, so sure walks. That puts runners at first and second and brings up Jeff Mantle. First base Mantle Jeff walked in his Mantle. own appearance in this game. Bobby Cox has had a couple of pitchers struggle here as Wallers came on and got out of the long seventh inning, but he's struggling with control. And Bourbon, he had to come out and get Bourbon, who just could not find the plate. Bobby's doing a little pacing right now. And the first pitch, a curveball to Mando, and he takes for ball one. Waller is throwing a lot of breaking balls, which is generally off of his pattern. When used in relief, he relies mainly on his hard fastball, but pitching in spring training and in the regular season sometimes is much different. And again, he misses for ball two. That may tell us something, Ralph. Generally, we see pitchers when they're working on something, throwing it. Maybe he's trying to develop that off-speed breaking ball. I would have to think so. To be a starter, you can't get by on just a fastball. Coming in to pitch the one or two batters usually can use that fastball to an advantage. And that's ball three, so Waller's running into the same problem that Boban had when he came in relief, running into some control problems. As they say in real estate, it's location, location, location. And that one was out of location, so that will load up the bases. 
He's not making any fees today, Ralph. <laughs> no sale. <laughs> no sale. And here comes the pitching coach, Ab, once again. Leo Mazzoni does not like going to the mound for these reasons. Twice he's had to go out now. He had to go out and see Borbone to try and settle him down. It didn't work. Now he's got to get Mark Wallers settled in. They really want Wallers, obviously, to, to be successful. When you throw as hard as he does, Ralph said clocked over 100 miles an hour and, and such a physical presence on the mound, he really can be a big part of this staff and be the closer, be the setup man, and be used the starter necessary. He's got to throw strikes. And even here, it's of concern when you're midway through spring training and Waller's all over the place. Not any particular point he's missing. He's just all over the place. And that'll bring up Maurice Rivera, who's batting for the first time. He came in the game as a pinch runner. And stayed in the ball game at second base. He ran for Jeff Kent, took over at second for Kent. He takes a fastball for a called strike. Rivera so far this spring hitting 333 10 hits and 30 at bats and amazingly with two home runs and six runs batted in he is certainly not noted for his power he came to the Mets from the Red Sox and before the Red Sox he was with Montreal now he's in the hole with a two strike count Wallers working from the set position with the bases loaded. He has the option of winding up in this situation. And he misses outside. <laughs> Rivera was signed by the Mets as a free agent. With the Red Sox last year, he was a 208 hitter with one home run. And there's strike three call. So, Wallers gets his third strikeout. It ends the inning. The Mets score one. And the score at the end of eight, it is the Mets six. And Atlanta nothing. And here's a word from Chemical. colors with the Mets MasterCard from Chemical Bank. If you have one, use it. If not, call 1-800-233-METS to apply. Going to the ninth inning, Mets leading at 6-0. This copyrighted telecast authorized under television rights granted by Sterling Doubleday Enterprises. Solely for the entertainment of our audience, any publication, reproduction, or use of the pictures, descriptions, and accounts of this game without the express written consent of Sterling Doubleday Enterprises is prohibited. Any commercial or the use of the program, such as by charging admission for its showing, is likewise prohibited. Right fielder, Tony Carrasco. As Atlanta bats here in the top of the ninth inning. Tony Tarasco will lead it off. He's one for two in today's game. He also has walked. And for Atlanta, it'll be the third, fourth, and fifth batters as they try to come back in this ball game. Mets with a run in the fourth, four in the seventh, and one in the eighth inning, and leading by a score of six nothing. This ball hit long to right, but pulling into foul territory, and it will be out of play. Carrasco's hit two home runs this spring. He's driven in 12. This is an important outing for Pete Shorick. Mets have used only two pitchers in this game with Gooden having the very impressive start and then Shorick coming on. As, uh, Pete's in a battle for a spot on this staff and he'd been hit hard previous outings. Giving up a lot of hits and a lot of runs off him. Yeah, the team has teams against him have hit 364 against him so far this spring in his three previous outings nine in the third innings he has given up 16 hits in this game he has given up a few hits but he's been able to get out of the jams 
Uh, four hits have been picked up off him, but got some help on a, on a double play ball. Some good infield work, and he's, and he's pitched well. He hasn't hurt himself by walking people. Two and two the count, and the curveball hangs inside, so a full count to Teresco with Ryan Kelsko on deck. Klesko 0 for 3. And the 3 2 pitch, ball four, so Shurik walks the leadoff batter here in the ninth inning. One of the things that you look at on the negative side man? when you have a six run Let's lead go. in the ninth inning, you have to make that batter hit his way on. He's walked only three and in nine innings coming into this game. But as you say, Ralph, that's a no-no right there. And now uh, Klesko, the batter, he takes the first pitch for strike one. Klesko. 0 for 3, hitting 257, coming in with one home run. And he hits it up the middle. It goes through for a base hit. So Klesko sends Carrasco down to second base, where he holds. And now the first two batters are on here in the ninth inning. Fifth hit given up in two plus innings by Pete Shurik, and that'll bring up Javier Lopez, who is one for three. Lopez singled off Shurik to left field back in the seventh inning. This ball is hit deep to left. It is gone. Goodbye. Parker doesn't even give it a look. A three-run home run, and the Atlanta Braves are on the scoreboard. Now, we were just talking about how important the outing was for Pete Shorick and got himself in trouble with a leadoff walk. Let's go up the middle and then no question about that. The young catcher, Javier Lopez, second home run this spring. He, as we said, he is a good contact hitter. Not known as a home run hitter in the minors, but can do it, as you see. And Shorick is going to come out of the game. Dallas has gone out to get him. That's tough. You know, he was three outs away from putting the ball game away. So it's now a six to three ball game. No one out. We're in the top of the ninth inning, and we'll be back right after this word from Bud Light. Braves with three in here in the ninth, and putting the ball game within reach on the three-run home run, and the new pitcher for the Mets. Jonathan Hurst getting some work. He was an acquisition on the free agent market. Free agent out of the minor league signed by the Mets. He's pitched very little Major League Baseball, appearing in only three Major League games since his career started in 1987. All of it's been minor league baseball. He's been worked with the Dodgers, Dodgers organization last year. Second base He's a non-rostered player from the Mets, and those are the numbers he had at Ottawa. Triple A ball for the Expos. Now Pete Jurek giving up this three-run home run, and that knocks him out of the box. And it puts the Braves into a position of being alive here, trailing now by three in the ninth with no one out. And Tony Graffanino will be the batter, and he fouls off the fastball. Graffanino batted in the seventh inning and grounded into a double play off Pete Shurik after Lopez had let off the inning with a single. misses high one ball and one strike Jonathan Harris back again and it's fouled back Hurst is working in his fifth spring game he's worked only five innings giving up four earned runs on uh, seven hits five strikeouts and three walks boy And now the one-two pitch, fastball missing. And that puts the count at two balls and two strikes. Wild 
tip. And it bounces out of the glove of Stanet. The count remains at two and two. Few clouds in the sky now. The temperature at game time in the 80s. And the fastball again. It's fouled again. So the count holds at two balls and two strikes. minor league career. Hurst has been a pretty good strikeout pitcher and and a good control pitcher. Started in the minors as a starter and has been in and out of the bullpen throughout the years up and down the minors. And this ball hit in the air to left field deep left field but over there in fair territory to make the catch is Parker and Rick picks up the first out with the catch. Braves, after lying low for most of this game, all of a sudden have come alive here in the ninth inning as they're getting pitches up in the strike zone. And Parker watched one go. That one he had room to make a play on. And that'll bring up pinch hitter Tim Gillis. Gillis, the pinch hitter. As the Braves try to stay alive. They're trailing by three here with one out in the top of the ninth inning. Gillis has been up one time in regular spring training games without a base hit. And that's strike one. You know you're in trouble when you don't have your name on the back of the uniform, are they? <laughs> Chances might not be too good. And especially if that number on the back of the uniform is high. <laughs> and he goes after that one, strike two. That was a good breaking ball. This is the Walt Reniac swing, only there wasn't any contact. Watch him release. Two strikes to count. And the fastball back for a ball that's one and two. Gillis, another one of the minor league free agents signed after four years in the minors. Hasn't played higher than double A ball. And he gets a curve and hits it in the air to left. It's well hit going back again as Parker, this time to his left side, and he hauls it in for out number two. So the Braves are down to their last out as they bat here in the top of the ninth inning. The Mets leading by a score of six to three. And the batter will be Hector Rojas. Rojas batting for the first time. Hector Rojas has not had an at bat for the Atlanta Braves in a regular spring training game. I don't think baseball is a lot like football in as much as you make the travel squad. It's a real accomplishment. That's right. They dug out yet another jersey with no name on the back <laughs> for Hector. <laughs> Hector Rojas, the one-strike pitch, hit off the end of the bat, strike two. There's another minor league free agent, four years in the minors, picked up minor league free agent list, and he has not played higher than double-A ball either, getting a chance here on this trip. So it's a two-strike count. Jonathan Hurst a strike away from ending this game, and here's the pitch, and it's fouled. It'll be out of play. Usually the travel squad, when you have a long travel trip, and there are some long ones in Florida, especially if you're on the East Coast and go to the West or vice versa, the stars don't make the trip and the uh, Scrabinis are on that bus. <laughs> this is only an hour away from West Palm Beach. That pitch a ball, it's one and two. And the one-two pitch. Chop foul. So Hector Rojas stays alive as he gets the most out of his at-bat here, his first one in a regular season spring training game. 
don't see many of those long buck bus trips anymore with the teams generally like these two teams playing each other more often than you used to in spring training six or eight times now instead of going to the other coast you just play the teams closest to you to keep the expenses down from travel and it's pole foul the other thing you don't see the barnstorming trips that you take at the end of spring training that they used to take when the California teams would start out and start playing in uh, Arizona, working their way back to Texas, Oklahoma City, playing a game in each single town, living on the trains, dressing in hotel rooms, getting on the train and traveling to the next city the next night. Get to see some wonderful towns like Bisbee, Arizona, Del Rio, Texas. You had home runs in all of them. Some of those ballparks, we played in racetracks, as a in matter of fact. In Del Rio, Texas, it was a racetrack that we played in. Almost stepped on a rattlesnake one time playing left field. Oh. Ground ball through the middle. And a base hit. So Rojas makes the most of his appearance for the Atlanta Braves. He can talk about that the rest of his life if he never gets back. And that'll bring up Jose Olmeda. Third baseman, Jose Olmeda. Alpine, Texas, another place that I played. Probably those racetrack type places didn't have any outfield walls or anything, did they? So with some of them no, wide they were open, right? Wide open parks. Yeah. This one hit to the middle. So now the tying run will come to the plate as Omida singles. And the Braves are still in this ball game. The tying run represented at the plate. Braves had done nothing in this ball game, being shut out six nothing, coming to the ninth inning, only at four hits, five hits, and now this inning they've started this out with a walk and three run homer by Lopez, and they're in it. And the batter will be Lee Heath, and Heath is hitting for the first time in a spring training game. So Lee Heath, a chance to make history for the Atlanta Braves. He swings and misses. When you got to battle a rattlesnake for a fly ball, I think I would have thought about maybe not playing that game. <laughs> As they say, when you're playing the outfield in that kind of territory, you walk very carefully. <laughs> Off the hands, grounded to second base, fielded there by Rivera. The throw to first base ends the ball game. So the Mets hang on and win it by a score of six to three. The Woody pitch in the ball game, Doc Good in a fine effort. Five innings, no runs, one hit, five strikeouts. And the losing pitch in the game, Kent Merker. And Merker working four innings, giving up one run, the home run to Glenn Davis. We'll be back with a recap right after this word from Macy's. New York Mets come away with the victory, Ralph. Yes, they do. Six to three, and the Mets now with a record of uh, 11 and eight. They're two and one over Atlanta so far this spring, and the Braves with a record of nine and seven. All right, Mets baseball 94 has been.